Hi, my name is Sol Ramirez. I'm a 19-year-old artist, musician, and puppeteer from North Carolina. And my specialty is, you know, uh, reggae researching and and being a, you know, just a reggae fan and, and lover. And especially in the area of Peter Tosh and the Three Whalers, Bob, Peter, and Bunny. And I'm excited for our part three, focusing on Peter today. Yes, greetings and blessings one and all. This is yours truly, Daddy Lion Shandell, music and entertainment analyst and historian, sound selector, founder of the Roots Dynamic Sound Movement and the Roots Dynamic Experience, my radio uh, program umbrella, uh, representing on Radio DLC and Primal, also part of the meditations since 2007. Uh, fellow documentarian, graphic artist, and, uh, and the whole 99 yards. My name is Zeb Brooks, musician and founder of the Griot Mare channel. And right now we are on part three of the top ranking series. So part three, we're focusing on Peter Tosh, uh, also known as the Stepping Razor or the Mystic Man or the Bush Doctor the and so on and so on. We are going to be going over and reviewing and ranking Peter's eight albums, seven studio albums, plus his 1984 live album. And we've all been reviewing uh, all of these albums a lot over the past you know, week or so. And we have, for our assistance, several CD reissues, deluxe editions. We have DVDs. We have compilations to hear different versions and liner notes. We have some 45 singles. We have the records and we have, of course, what's been one of our main assistants for the video is the definitive discography on the Whalers by Leroy Jody Peter Pearson and Roger Steffens. Right on. Yeah, thanks again. We usually do our thanks at the beginning. So thanks to Roger for, you know, just his continued work in preserving and documenting reggae and making sure that the stories and most importantly, the credits continue to live on past, you know, the recordings. And uh, yeah, thanks to uh, Andrew Dixon and Elliot Roberts too, again, for helping inspire me with the idea to take album rankings into the world of reggae and especially of the greatest reggae band ever the whalers got to give it up overall uh to uh to to timothy white for setting set, setting the starting point in terms of the documentation of the music of uh of the whalers catch a fire the life of uh bob marley which has been revised numerous times special shouts out to uh Roger Stephens and uh, Leroy Jody Pearson for extending, uh, ultimately extending the uh, that line of documentation, uh, the the disc, disc discographical documentation into uh, this particular document right here, this book. And I didn't get to do this in the last one. I'd like to give a shout out to Eric from the Blood and Fire Facebook group who mm. supplied us with Bunny Whaler's Rub-A-Dub album. Right, mm. yeah. Yes, yes. That was nice to hear. Yeah. So, Eric, thanks again. Um, that helped out a lot and put things in perspective, and we really appreciate it. A special thanks to all the viewers and everyone who's been supporting the channel and for all the encouragement and the motivation to keep doing this. And there's big, big, big things happening. All around. major things happening on the way. Yeah. So let's believe that. Get ready for it. It's going to be big. First on the list, legalize it. There it is. Legalize it, man. Mm. Well, first, I'll just say where I put it. Um, <laughs> it's number eight on my list. Oh, wow. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I knew I was gonna get that reaction. Uh, <laughs> well, the, to, uh, the reaction, yes, 
I'm not no I'm not I'm not surprised that it would not that in your case it may not necessarily be within say the top five but to be eight yeah I think I think that's particularly where the reaction may be yeah coming from, I don't think from here now. yeah now that'll be a fun one to check in on the comments <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna hear someone say I got his address let's get him <laughs> <laughs> by any chance the low rating may have something to do with the fact that this is the most uh, the maybe maybe the title track uh, you know gives off sense of uh, overplay, not even over commercialization, but overplay. Um, not and, really. and I guess more people, and I guess more people may tend to know this album above all else, you know. Uh, well, I mean, there is the popularity factor of it, but that right. di that didn't even that, phase yeah. me about it. It's yeah. really because I think that as he went on, he got better and better. Okay, you know, right. uh, so this album was like the jumping off point. Right. Uh, and then, of course, as has been said before, this one, along with Blackheart Man, are basically Whaler's albums. I like the raw sound from it. You know, it was, it was right. well produced. And I made a mistake earlier. It was co-produced by Lee Jaffe. Yeah, I was about to say. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, uh, I love what you're going to do when you're well, when your well runs dry. How, how, you, you, wait, you see, you see what you did right there? No, hold on. I had to get you right there. Did, did you realize what just happened? No, what did I do? What you gonna do when your well runs dry? Oh, I didn't even know what you gonna do now. Oh, what you gonna do? <laughs> wow, I didn't even notice that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because the, the, the title track is Till. Right. Your well runs dry. Yeah, I was gonna correct myself when right. when I looked down and I saw it, it's till your well runs dry. But I said no, 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 no. You no, you you were good. You, you were good. It was just the way it came out. Almost <laughs> sounded. Yeah. It, it just sounded as if you were um, finishing the lyrics. As, yeah. as, as if you were just, just <laughs> put saying the whole phrase as that one title. But I yeah. knew what, what what you were saying. You were saying mm -hmm. what you're gonna do and till your well runs dry. Yeah. You know. Um, oh, that's boss right there. Why Must I Cry is excellent. Uh, yeah. Yes. Beautiful harmonies on that one. Yeah. And then Catchy Shubi. I always love Catchy Shubi. And that's, yes. that's my favorite one on the album. I have legalized it at number three on my ranking. I just, uh, you know, in my, in my eyes, you can't let legalize it get too far away just due to its, you know, iconicness for Peter. It's just kind of like how... I had Exodus at number five, even though maybe in some ways I might have ranked it a little bit low, lower, uh, but just because of its, you know, iconicness as Bob's album, really, amongst the main mainstream. Um, but I really, I was just listening to it like 10 minutes before we started, just to, to re-listen. I, I really love this album. It's, you know, with both... All three of them, Bob, Peter, and Bunny, all have extremely strong starts to their solo records. Um, you know, Bunny, I think that out of the three of them, obviously having the the strongest with Blackheart Man. But uh, you know, a, a point that Rogers made before is that this is still a Whalers record. You know, this is this has co uh, writer credit for Bob. It has Bunny all over the uh, vocal harmonies. And, 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 and yeah. Bunny as well. Yeah, yeah. Bunny all over the uh, vocal harmonies. And uh, I think one interesting thing about, you know, the original um, record, uh, the original LP release is the back cover and how, you know, because this is introducing the world to Peter as a solo artist, that they have mm. the the photo of the three of them from the 1975 dream concert. Mm. Uh, so that's interesting because just the back of the record changes almost depending on each reissue. 
This was the original one. This was the 1999 CD remix. And then this was the 2011 Legacy Edition. Ooh. So uh, they, the front definitely is the most iconic part out of the two because that stayed the same throughout the time. Right. Um, you know, it's it's his most iconic album. The the this is something you'll see, you know, all over the place. This pose, this front cover. Oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, it it is. I think looking back at it, the the riskiness. In bravery, I think is lost a little bit on posing in a cannabis field for your album, especially your debut, mm. and uh, you know, singing legalize it. Um, I think you know it just it shows the kind of musician and person Peter was really to uh, to be able to to wear that on his sleeve and not uh, you know put. The potential consequences first in his you know worries or thoughts on whether or not to do it uh so legalize it obviously is the hit from the album burial is uh really interesting because it's a you know remake of a whaler's song a whaler's tune, right? uh -huh. bunny and peter on backing vocals on this track too sound great and you can hear it even better on the uh original jamaican mix of the track too uh yeah. what you gonna do I really, I really love what you're gonna do. I think what's what's nice about it. It's a side of Peter. I don't think we see too much moving forward. At times you do, but he's taking these really real, real life situations of you know living in Jamaica and really just you know not one of the higher ups in society and your you know constant daily battles. But he's also adding a little bit of humor with it all. No sympathy. First, again, another Whalers remake. So I guess going to the history of the album, the majorities mm. are recorded in 1975, mm. right. uh, you know, late 1974, 1975. And you can tell, I think this is Peter's first album because there are a handful of remakes and these are songs that he's been working on since, you know, the departure of the Whalers. So it's, I think a lot of people looking at it just timeline wise, he leaves early 1974. It takes two years for Bunny and him to put out their first album. They're like, why would it take so long? But really, you know, the singles are coming out in 1975. They're still performing with Bob throughout 74 and 75 on occasion when he's in Jamaica. So they're right. still very active amongst the whalers in the recording of it all. And uh, so No Sympathy is a remake of an older whalers track. And uh, Why Must I Cry is really interesting to me because I've always loved the track, but I've always really been interested in the Marley co-write credit. And was this... Was that one? Yeah, it's a Marley Tosh composition. Mm. And mm. it makes me wonder, uh, you know, was this a potential Whaler song at one point? I mean, I guess it must have been. I think going back to the, the Whalers, of this being really kind of a honorary Whalers album, um, I think there's some misconception with it, but Bob did help fund this album. It really, again, mm -hmm. shows the fact that the three of them were more connected than I think people like to, to think amongst yeah. this breakup period into the first couple of solo albums. I think people yeah. think both Bunny and Peter just completely walked away, mm -hmm. never looked back, you know, getting to Bush Doctor later on. Don't look right. back. But um, they're all very much connected yep. into 1976 and even onward too. But um, yeah, so why must I cry? It? And the fact that Bob helped uh, fund it show and uh, let Job be praised. Xavier is one of Peter's best songs. I think Absolutely. the thundering feel of the song and Peter's just intense vocal delivery of it and the the key, the keyboards in it, and the sound effects, and the synths, and everything about it is just so powerful. And the the run out of "Kill Them Dead Before Them Spread" for you know the last minute of the song almost. It's just a a very powerful one yeah. to to end the track with. I, I like the way you describe it. It does that whole thing sounds like a storm. 
Yeah, totally. Till Your Well Runs Dry, another um, Whalers remake. And again, just like Burial has uh, Bunny as the co-writer, you could see this being, you know, you can see the compare the uh, parallels to Nazi Dread with this song because there's a, a very yeah. strong feel. And I just, I love the, the concept of the verses being more bluesy and then jumps into the reggae rhythm for the chorus. And um, yeah, it's a great, it's a great track. And uh, Brand New Secondhand, another Whalers remake is just, again, kind of a, it's a- Killed it's a, it on that one. Yeah. It's, on a, it's, a, it's a, it's a really funny one. And I've seen Neville Garrick talk about the lyrics and just, you know, why he, you know, loved Peter and, and just how, how funny he could be. I mean, he's just like, you know, damn, he's just like totally <laughs> calling out this woman, whoever it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I don't know if it's based on true events or anything, but if it is, imagine being that, that girl and it gets remade like three times. <laughs> just th think 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 about it think about it so don't, don't exalt your painted face because underneath that face you are just a disgrace and yeah it's just a brand new second hand that is th that is literally the world of instagram and of today yeah mm -hmm. it's weird too because i think it's important to see that it wasn't the smash hit that it is now amongst you know the reggae essentials in, outside right. of jamaica um, yeah. Even the UK didn't give it too much attention. I mean, the song, the t the title track, the single was banned on Jamaican airways. And so what Peter did, because the record was banned, is he paid for um, a magazine ad and printed the lyrics as his ad that he paid for. So in some way or one way or another, he was going to get the message out to the people. This is my... Uh, yeah. 45 with the uh the version there's also a lot of a lot of different versions of legalize it yeah here just to show show off here's the the kind of the ep of it um has legalize it why must i cry until your well runs dry okay here i gotta get it okay. yeah yeah we and then yeah. here's side one hmm. there oh, you nice. go. yeah so super cool. And these are also the Jamaican mixes. I don't know if they're the exact same as what's on the Legacy Edition or if they're another different mix, but especially Legalize It is for sure a, a, a different mix from what's on the final album. I, I, did, I didn't figure that Legalize It for me would be number one. You know? But it is because as far as how I, how, how I, how I do it, how I do it, you... you by now you're probably familiar how how it is for me you get a feel for how i do things um it, it, it's all it's all from you know from original uh listening and also it's about listenability from back to front and and the sound there's there's going to be a lot of difference in sound clearly as as, as we go along uh he, he was officially signed to cbs mm -hmm. he was officially signed to cbs but in the uk it was released on virgin Right. CBS UK was not doing. First of all, they they really weren't dealing with reggae at that time, so that's a so that's a huge part of the reason why they did not, why the UK branch did not get the license for the two Peter Tosh Columbia uh, albums. In, in, incidentally, so so that I found very very interesting. But then again, I guess it's also ironic since Virgin Records was also being distributed by CBS in the US. Could have been could have been a matter of exchange since Virgin was was more of a reggae it was dealing more with reggae in the UK as right. as that was the origin. So right now as I, as I'm uh, speaking it it's come it, it came to mind that uh, Yeah, that's definitely a... that's definitely the case. And I'm glad you pointed out, you know, that a lot of people may have had this uh, misconception. But as more people come to the realization of the nature of, uh, particularly those f those first two albums for for Peter and uh, uh, Bunny, they they see they they can clearly see and they can hear it. Just 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 know just knowing that the Whalers were involved on both albums, the Whalers yeah. band was involved on both albums, and 
that they were inter interchanging uh interchanging uh interlocking with one another on those uh those particular tracks clearly showed the connection Th those two labels by by the way uh Solomonic for Bunny Whaler and Intel Diplo HIM for for Peter Tosh they they start they started early they started yeah. early on they started way early on before before most people outside uh caught on and they were both being distributed by Tough Gong yeah 72 yeah yeah, they, 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 they were, they were, it was all, it was all, it, it was all uh, coming together. So it was, uh, it was a thing where clearly Bob knew just as the others did that they were, th there's a reason why they are the whalers, that, that trio right there. That there's, there's the reason why there's the, the you got the three hands right there. Mm -hmm. the, 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 this is, it's a link, it's a chain, a chain link of leadership. I think another thing that people don't know is mm -hmm. almost all three of them, despite Peter's issues with Blackwell, had their debut album on Island. This was close to being an Island release. There mm. is a super rare legalize it single with the mm. Island pressing in the in the uh, sticker, um, but they ordered them all destroyed before they were released. Uh huh. Yeah. So this was also almost an Island record, and uh, you know, it, it, there's some there's other interesting things with um, the labels and stuff moving um, later on how Peter almost came back to CBS later, even though he was very public about, you know, just not being pleased with their um, promotion of mm -hmm. reggae albums. So with oh. Kim and Jeff Walker, um, Jeff was the publicist for both Peter and uh, Bob. He was for, worked with Island, but got special permission from Blackwell to follow Peter to CBS. There is a uh, oddly way too common misunderstanding with I think a lot of um, kind of outside reggae fans or people who just really do not bother to do any research at all. Um, that burial is about Peter not going to Bob's, um, which just a quick Google search or just thought would disprove that. And the original song was from the 60s with the Whalers. Exactly. Um, and is a shared belief amongst all three of them. Yeah. Which, by, by the way, just, just hold up your copy right there for, for one second. Uh, hold it up to the camera. Uh, yeah. F fellow people, anyone who has had it in in their minds that, that Burrell was about not going to Bob's funeral, just get a copy of this album right here. From 67, 76, it's still way before 1981. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. or, or, they're yeah. implying that Peter's a time traveler. <laughs> well, he was walking in. Well, the he's future. a mystic man. He's, he's a mystic <laughs> man. <laughs> there you go. But yeah. Also, you better know. yet, maybe do go listen to the, you know, 66, 67 recording and hear Bob singing on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, just you know, simple you things like that where it's feeding to a, a totally false narrative. You know, there were tensions. Look, there's no family that's not going to fight at some point at or some at point, times man. or have grudges or or things. You know, I think P Peter said things about Bob that I don't agree with. And who knows if he really even agreed with too at times. Who knows what was just part of his kind of macho, kind of scary persona that he portrayed to a lot of the white media uh burial is again it's one of those situations where between the original and this version are in incomparable why why must i cry it's just absolute excellence and you mentioned the co-credit between uh tosh and marley think about it think about think about the whalers tracks from back in the no, no just think about how marley writes right there you can definitely tell at least if, if you were to do say uh, an impromptu breakdown of 
the lyrics like who wrote what if you if you were to like put it in a hi like highlight the marker you use a highlight use a highlighter to figure out which ones which parts came from bob or which ones came from peter you, you could you can almost always get the parts that came from bob you know uh, and and uh, i will never fall in love again because only my heart feels the pain that's a bobism right there apparently uh what you're gonna do and burial were recorded in late 73 ah and oh yes and 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 there was an original release of that also on uh intel diplo but uh, right. by be a tough gong right yeah and then why must i cry until your well runs dry is early 74 mm -hmm. and legalize it and legalize it. exhibir was early 75 early 75 yeah. okay especially Ketchy shubi quintessential definitely for me uh quintessential caribbean cooking uh so, so, songs to to play while uh while the caribbean family while you have a while the caribbean family is cooking food uh especially on a sunday you know catchy should be definitely uh, uh, put in particular out of all those uh plays that role for me it, it's that kind of uh it, it's that kind of album indeed igzia beer let's let jabi praise powerful powerful song of praise the only only criticism i would ever have with that is because you were talking about the sound effects and synths and whatnot the 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 thunder yeah it was the weakest one of the, the the emulation of the thunder was was probably the uh the weakest one uh sound effect of all so that kind of threw me off because i'm listening to him and he's as, as he's singing so i'm looking for those sound effects to match him but here's the thing as weak as the attempt at that time, it was 76, so what are you gonna, or, or 75 actually. Uh, as weak as the sound effects were, Peter's voice made up for it. The power of the song made up for it. It was just Peter himself alone, his 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 vocalization, his his declaration, let Jah be praised. That was it right there. And everything else, everything else just came together. So that's just a song. A brand new second hand, uh, which also actually counts with those other three songs. Uh, this rendition, definite uh, again, both in incomparable, but this one definitely actually adds a little bit more toughness right there. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely extra tougher. He he really, he, uh, it's like we can appreciate what, what the the original Whalers version, but no, actually, I will say that this one is actually more, way more tough. All right. So we did that. I actually one more one more fun fact. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the the cool thing about the photo of the Wonder Dream concert is that's the first time that Legalize is performed live, and it's with the three of them. Right? Is it? Isn't there a video of that as well? There, there is footage uh, of that, no? Somewhere there's there's somewhere. available there's... audio, but yeah, there's yeah. Footage, oh, there's okay. footage that's in possession of someone out there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, some. I, mean, I remember I seeing remember some black and I remember seeing some black and white footage. Yeah, but it was very uh, faint. There's a very quick clip of it in the Marley documentary. Yep, that was it. Yeah, equal rights. So, so yeah, um, equal rights is number five on my list. Yeah, he's got the legacy edition too. Yeah, yeah, I really like the legacy edition, and there's it's something great. I want I, I wanted to point point out about it. Um, this one was recorded at Randy's Studio 17. And this is when Sly and Robbie come into the picture. Mm. So this is the beginning of the word sound and power band, which by the way, one of the greatest names ever for a band. Yeah. Mm. But I do believe Robbie and uh, Sly and Robbie are on Legalize It and they are on the tour, but this is the first time that it's like kind of the cemented group because it yes. also has a lot of the Whaler members too on Legalize It. Yes, thanks for pointing that out because yeah, that, that was the, they were on that 76 tour. Right, for Live was, and Dangerous. For Live and Dangerous, yeah. Remember when I mentioned Rosterman Vibration and how the high frequencies were sort of mid-range? Right, yeah. Yeah, and this Brand one has, has sort of a... Uh, 
diminished kind of high frequency to it. Mm. I think it was, it was just the quality of the tape. But at times it's really sharp. And then at times it's sort of faint. Um, which out of all of the Peter Tosh albums, it gives it a unique sound. Um, I really like how this rendition of Get Up Stand Up is. This one just carries a bite to it, you know? Mm. Just just the way yeah. it, 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 it's just like chopping like that, you know? <laughs> uh, look at that. <laughs> that photo is awesome. That was, yeah. Lee Jaffe took that photo, right? Yeah. Down Presser Man. Which is Whaler's remake. This is a good version, but I do like the Upsetter version better hmm. because just like with Four Hundred Years, oh, Four Hundred Years and and the original Downpresser version with Upsetter, it is it's really just dark and ghostly, right. you know. It's haunting, haunting. Yeah. Then we have Stepping Razor. Now, this is where you hear Sly really trying to break the one drop cycle. They did go on to say that later on, Peter gave them more and more freedom to kind of just do their thing. The first couple of years, Peter was very much, we got to keep it in this kind of uh, path and, and uh, style. And then I think probably around Come Bush Doctor, Mystic Man, it was very much just, you know, do, yeah. do you. Yeah. Yeah. The way that intro, that disco drum pattern on uh, um, on the intro and how it accompanies Peter's wah-wah guitar, you know? And the way Peter plays the wah on his guitar is very distinctive. With Peter, I notice he does, he sustains the strings when he, when he uh, pulls back on the wah. So it's sort of like this whipping kind of sound when, when he plays it. Joe Cocker. Joe Cocker, uh, right around the time of Legalize It in 1976, recorded, mm -hmm. put out an album called Stingray. And uh, it was recorded in Jamaica, and Peter's on a couple of tracks. And you can tell, even though it's not, you know, what you would maybe you would think Peter would be on, it's you can you know when it's Peter. And I even go to the comments, there's no credits on the YouTube video, but people are like, This is this sounds like Peter Tosh. I know, um, I know Peter when I hear it and stuff. And he even arranged uh, Joe Cocker's cover of Bob Dylan's "The Man and Me," so yeah, he arranged uh, and uh, helped with that. And so, but yeah, Peter's. Um, and then once we get to '78, too, I'll talk about more. But even though with the injuries and everything, he still kept the wah guitar as you know one of his signature things, especially with the. I um, hope so. Yeah, the M16 guitar too. That's cool. Watching the little footage that there is with the M16 guitar with the the wah style and everything. I read in Lee Jaffe's book, and I should have pulled it out, but it's stored away somewhere. Mm. For that session with Joe Cocker, apparently he was so nervous to meet them that he drank himself unconscious. Oh boy! So. Oh, By the man. time they reached the studio, he was out. So Peter oh, and Joe Cocker, yeah. Joe Cocker was just knocked out because... And so Peter and Tyrone and, and whoever else was there laid down the tracks with the Legacy Edition now. Mm. It does contain uh, the outtakes. So he did over 400 years. He even has a version of Hammer. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, and, and so I wager can't blame the youth should be on there as well, right? Yep. All from yeah. that same session. Mark of the Beast was okay. I felt that they did it better on that live and dangerous, you know. I, I like the way it sounded on the live and dangerous um album. Then you have Vampire. First time I heard that song, it was the dub version. Uh. I was six or seven years old. Hearing this on a cassette in the middle of the night, I didn't sleep. <laughs> That's how freaking scary that, that this version is. The non-nuclear war version is good, but the original version is much, much yeah. darker and yeah. It's it, it's a it's a creepy song, you know. And uh, bunny 
Danny does the um does the laugh at the, the beginning. The, yeah, the laugh and the vampire noises and, and stuff. Yeah. It's because yeah, in the dub, you, you hear that at the beginning, and then you hear a little bit of the vocals and it cuts out. Then you hear this piercing scream. Mm. And that's in the background of this creepy bass line from Robbie. The two demos included on disc two, those are from the No Nuclear War sessions. Yes, and that was what I was going to ask you. Mm. Uh, because that made no sense why they were on there. Not at all. It's it, that, that was careless by them. Besides that, I mean, I love hearing it, but it just doesn't match with the year. And it's only because they saw this, the title tracks. Yeah. Or the name of the tracks. So it's interesting how you're making the Rossman vibration comparison because just like Rossman vibration for Bob, equal rights for me is number one in my ranking. <laughs> um, it, this was my first Peter CD. Um, my dad, I was huge on Bob, really getting into the Whalers. And my dad, you know, I think for a, for a birthday present, or actually, no, I think he just, you know, he liked, we both like looking at record stores and I must have been 13 or something. We saw the CD selection they had and I was, you know, looking at them and I saw there was two CDs for Peter um, back when the stuff was still in print. And one was, they're both the 99 remasters. One was Legalize It and the other was Equal Rights. And I was looking at both of them. I wanted to get a Peter CD. Um, Because I wanted to take that next step and see what Peter was all about. I was looking at them, and as a 13 year old, I felt like I could comprehend the the theme of equal rights more at that age than legalize it. I felt like I'd be able to connect with it more. And um, I when I played, I mean, my I was just taken to another place when listening to this, and um, it. I just, I have so many fond memories of it. I also grew up knowing the 82 recording of Pick Myself Up in African that are included as bonus tracks for some reason. Doesn't yeah. really make sense. Um, <sighs> I also just remember, I remember seeing this cover and especially seeing the photo on the back. I just was like, wow, th- this is a revolutionary dude. This dude is cool. And then when you open it up to- There you go. I just, I, this was Peter for me. This was my first introduction to him really outside of, you know, can't blame the youth and stop that train. And um, mm-hmm. I also, one thing that, I don't know how, how you guys feel about it. Um, I've always felt a really calm, calming feeling and sensation while listening to this album. It relaxes me and it. There's something about the mix of it all. that yeah. just makes me feel you know at ease and it's weird because i've I've always felt that in um i didn't know how other people felt and once in class during middle school my teacher put me in charge because you know he loves my music taste he put me in charge of putting background music on for silent writing time and i played equal rights the whole album and the girl who i know still doesn't listen to reggae not into reggae really turned to me and was like, this is really relaxing. This is like really nice music just to listen to and write. And I was like, see, other people feel feel this way. And mm-hmm. um, I mean, it, I Bunny's, Bunny and Peter's backup vocals on this, I think even w- more than legalize it, Bunny especially just shines on this as the backing. Um, yes. These are total Whaler harmonies for sure. And the the mix of this album I love too. And I also put that um, the clavinet and guitar really add a good um, unique style to this album. I think both by Peter, the wah and the, the clav. I cannot leave a single track off of this in my best tracks. Jaw Guide is one of Peter's best songs. I might disagree with Down Presser Man. I think I like this version more. I do like the Whalers version for sure. And there's a total, there's a, it's scary to me almost. Like there's a hauntiness to Peter's whale of of his delivery there. 
Yes. And um, also a, a presser man on the Trans Am label um, mm. in 19, I think, 71. So that's mm. the th third re-recording. Oh, second. Uh, there's Sinner Man. Oh, no, 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 no. You're right. You're right. They, they did Sinner Man way back. Yeah. Uh, I think then the Wayland Solomon era. Yeah. Then, came, uh, then came the Upsetter. Version. Yeah. And then, and then the Trans one. Am is, is Solo, Peter. Is solo. Right. And that one's... Um, so that one's titled Oppressor Man. And that yeah. one's also scary, but it's weird. It's in a different way. It's because of how raw and stripped down the whole track feels. Mm. And it's like Peter's delivery. He's laughing on the track as he's telling this person that he can't run anywhere. That intro, I think, make, makes up for maybe what's lacking on the haunting level for the rest of it, maybe compared to the Whalers version. Just that intro, that slow start to it is so good on this. I Am That I Am is a total masterpiece, one of Peter's the bests. And it's one that, you know, there's a there's a surprising amount of crossover with some of my friends that aren't full, they they love reggae, but they're just not fully into it um, or into the world of reggae. But I Am That I Am reaches them and they just, they love it. Um, Stepping Razor, written by Joe Higgs. Um, it's interesting because I think some of the first pressings are credited to Peter before he, told them that that wasn't true and um you know shows maybe the difference between bunny and peter a little bit with their earlier albums on making sure writer credits are applied appropriately <laughs> mm -hmm. um, i love the wah guitar on the studio version of african too and then apartheid too i really love this version more than no nuclear war um i think this one's um, there's, um, there's more of a militancy in this one because, um, I feel like Peter's making more of a statement with this. I feel like it's better delivered in a more straightforward way, how he sings it on this versus the more Peter, Peter seems like now that his kind of his voice had healed some over that gap between mama Africa and no nuclear war, mm -hmm. that he was kind of really going for just a full singing sing song voice and i right. think the more deadpan delivery on this one um makes a stronger point it's also interesting because this has um no hospitals for black people um you know he's black people in each part in no nuclear war it's just you know my people but he's making a point on this for you to know who his people are yeah. and uh, I think that just adds to the militancy of it too. Um, I really love all the outtakes from it. I I can't believe Hammer was not included though. Hammer, I, I think, might be one of my favorites from this session. Uh, absolutely, yeah. It's the Nyabingi drums on it and the keyboards, and the, the guitars, everything about it. And his just, his singing in it is great. And just everything about it, I love. And I love that this is the full version too, because there is a blank um, single release that cuts it at like halfway. And you don't even get to hear about the can't stop the trees from growing, can't stop the wind from blowing, can't stop mm. the sun from shining. And I think especially once he gets to the can't stop the sun from shining part, it's like he's reached that peak of the song. I mean, it's just... I love I love Hammer, and I remember when my dad and I first bought this Legacy Edition, and we heard that track. Our mouths were just open. We we're like, "How? Who? Who made that call? Who made the decision for that to not be on the track?" And if it's someone at CBS, they deserve to be fired because that could have made already what, in my opinion, is Peter's greatest album, and also top three reggae albums ever, in my opinion. Um, that could have even pushed it even higher up. I'm glad you made mention of that because I'm glad you you concluded the sentence as you did because here's the thing. I always, for all intents and purposes, I always did like equal rights slightly better than I slightly better than I did legalize it. Equal rights was always, which is why I was saying earlier how it was kind of tough for me, why it was always my number one. Equal rights was my number one, so obviously in this case it is number two, mainly because, number one, because of the rendition of Get Up, Stand Up, not that I'm saying it's bad, 
but think of how how it seems a little too like you said deadpan the arrangement for all intents and purposes is the most deadpan of of all three in ter- in terms of and I'm just talking about the the, the musicianship part of it right there right right it, where, where, where you see the original Whalers um version there's there's a couple of twists and turns Bunny's uh version aside from being as different as it is there are some twists and turns with the musicianship the, with the the Peter Tosh version is like one chord right and it's one changes. chord that he's the, huh and comparing it later on to the live version too will be really interesting right. <laughs> I was also wondering, have you have you heard the outtake of it from this version or the alternate version? Because what I always found was super interesting was it's we're sick and tired of this game of technology, humbly asking Jesus for his mercy. Oh. It's the original version in the outtake or in the alternate mm-hmm. version. He 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 goes on the full sick and tired of this BS game, dying, go to heaven in, in Lord Jesus name. Right. Um, and Herbie Miller told him, don't include it, record over it. You're going to lose a portion of your market if you really make that part of a stab. There's also, you know, the use of a certain word that you don't hear at all in any of Peter's recorded works officially that, again, suggested by management, Peter takes out because he might, you know, alienate his black American audience mm. with that word. Oh. And uh, so they uh, they take it out, but it's in the uh, alternate version. And I think we only have the alternate version because somehow a couple of copies were pressed before the re-recording. Mm. Oh, okay. That, that, that'll be something to, to, to look at. Regarding apartheid, and I can't believe I didn't, well, I didn't want to mention every track because I wanted everyone to point out you know, right. their, their tracks. But Apartheid is one of the first, if not the first songs about Apartheid. Apartheid. Yeah, I think it's Robbie who was saying he thought it was just some of Peter's wordplay, like he usually did. Oh, he no. didn't even know what the word was. He didn't know anything about it. He thought it was just Peter, you know, messing around, making some word for a system. And so Peter literally taught his band about the struggles of Apartheid. Especially during that time, 1977, mm-hmm. who was talking about it? Who was ever talking about it? That? It didn't start to gain traction until the mid mid 80s. It ultimately is a solid album, but like, but the 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 points that, like I said, brought it down to to number two. Like I said, was the the deadpan mu chord delivery delivery in terms of uh, Peter's rendition of "Get Up, Stand Up." And the and the omission of those two tracks. See, I found I found the 45 release of Can't Blame the Youth and Hammer on the other side. And right. as I was listening to it, I know I was like, okay, this is not on any one of his albums. This is strictly a Jamaican release. And clearly this was this definitely came from one of those two albums. And I'm I, I was leaning uh more toward uh more toward e- equal rights but by, by by this point so what's weird another weird thing about the legacy edition is they put you can't blame the dub and that's the you can't blame the youth dub track no that's just the one that was released on the other side of hammer in 1980 it's not a dub track it's just an alternate recording um Ooh. but in Colombia. Yeah, for that for that recording too. What's interesting is there's additional lyrics than the kind of more classic Whalers rendition that we've heard, and they're interesting right. too. Like teach the youth to believe in Jesus, it didn't work. Teach the youth to die and go to heaven, it never worked. Teach the youth about Haley Mary, it never worked. So you can't blame the youth. So that's mm. like a new addition post Whalers too, which is interesting. Jog guide in itself is i mean Af- oh african oh by far uh, african and especially jack guide and, and, and oh i forgot to mention i am what i am De- definitely crucial crucial too just just the opening lines alone mean uh definitely speaks volumes as far as uh, yours truly you know as personally speaking you know uh, i'm not one to live up to your exp- uh, expectations neither are you to live up to mine 
you know that that's that's crucial right there and that, that's yeah. the most interesting uh uh phrasing and how he put i'm just talking about the whole the overall song um of course that uh that city line at, at, in the last verse <laughs> it, it seems it seems almost kind of slick kind of slick like like he had the slick uh like I, I had to kind of slide that in like for as much as they were trying to hold on to some uh decency yeah he's, he's, you notice how he kind of he's he, he sort of slid that in right there man it, yeah. it's just oh, oh you, you heard that. Are you did you hear that yeah you, you definitely heard that right? it's interesting too because even though this is the second album it's not the debut i feel like there's really there's a a, a power in a, a hit with the it's time you recognize my quality like peter mm. is here and he's showing it with this album i mean yeah. legalize it's a classic but you know he sh- he's proving it even more with he, he, rights he, he he just really really drove it extra hard and like and like i was saying with jack guide which in which pete bunny whalers vocals are among the most prominent yeah. in the harmonies as far as the, the two albums are concerned you can you, it, there's no mistaking you can hear bunny whaler yeah, yeah. That's, and where, it's that's where he shines the most yes yeah. it is so it is magnanimously beautiful the the two of the two of them together for this particular song that one hits the hardest definitely one of the all-time greatest peter tosh songs and that one was enough for all intents and purposes, to really kick it to number one, even with all the flaws that I just ma- made mention of, but the, the, the flaws that I mentioned kind of stick out, you, you know, even still. But but like I said, Jagide in itself was enough to to seal seal this album off, and it does uh, for, make it the classic that it is right there. Bush Doctor. So, can you pull up your your copy that you have? Oh, and sh- yeah, I've yeah I've thought see. about this. There are so many variations to the Bush Doctor cover. There's that more full leaf design, which is by Neville Garrett, that hmm. that written out Bush Doctor part. That's his contribution. So technically, his first appearance on a Tosh cover. This is the, uh, the American, yeah, the, the American, U.S. UK version. Yeah. Then I believe there might even be another one where the green on the Neville design is more yellow. And then on the Jamaican version, the whole thing is mirrored and you see the cutoff of Peter's jeans starting at the bottom too. Oh. So there's like four different versions of this, this uh, cover. And same with the back. It's also mirrored on the Jamaican release. Mm-hmm. Mm. So check this out. 1978. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Neville does the leaf design. Mm-hmm. We also get Kaya. With the leaf design. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about that parallel. Yeah. First album on CBS was number eight. First album on EMI is number seven on my list. This album isn't the strongest out of the, the, the Rolling Stone albums or just the EMI work in general. I love the version of Soon Come on this one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Stand Firm. Yeah. Creation is so mystical and, and there's just so many parts to it. Imagine for the people who only bought this because they heard Mick Jagger on the single and they get to that <laughs> too. I mean, those bald heads were feeling that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, we're back on track. I'm also putting Bush Doctor at number seven for mine. Um, just to just to again with Bob, there's no bad album of Peter's. Um, yeah. and it was hard. I mean, like the top five, it was like, oh, this could be number one, this could be number one. Um, I, and I think there's also Bush Doctor, even though it's at number seven of eight for me, way too uh there's way too much criticism for it in my opinion. Um, it has always been panned as Peter selling out and Peter's pop record. And I think mm-hmm. the people who say that is only because they listen to the... The Mick the, Jagger. In, yeah, Dwayne. with Mick Jagger. Who, yeah. Which, you know, it's not my favorite, that track. It, you know, I, in, I like the Rolling Stones too. I'm a Rolling Stones fan. But I think a majority of the reason I don't love it so much is just... Mick could have had another vocal take, maybe. Um, yeah, definitely. And um, 
in yeah there but i like it too and also i don't it's definitely pop there's definitely a, a pop element to it and um you know there's the interesting saxophone solo and i've seen the saxophone solo people seem to hate the saxophone on this album for some reason some people reviewing it um they hate it on walk and don't look back they hate it on the, i'm the toughest um i mm. i'm fine with it and i think also we have to look at in in real time when it was coming out you're going up against what in my opinion was your best album that you just put out the hardest hitter it's yeah. equal rights it that's yep. the concept of that album all that's these become a stand that's become now a standard by which he would have to beat all these hard hitting political songs you just delivered the performance of a life for many and it's just one of peter for many artists one love peace concert that's their you know definitive performance their biggest accomplishment for peter it's just one of his great live performances but yeah. you've you've done all of this you know rattling up of the jamaican politics in the past year and then the first song people hear on this is walk and don't look back and i think that's a lot of the reason for the criticism is because it's just different from equal rights which i don't think is fair uh shandell you're saying how some uh especially get up stand up you feel is a little bit too straightforward deadpan i mean there's not this on bush doctor he's i mean especially right. on moses you think you know what they're doing and then all of a sudden you hear this break that's dun 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 and it's oh, like oh oh <laughs> when i heard it the first time i was like what is going on i liked it but i was like this isn't what what <laughs> this isn't one job <laughs> what is going on? and it was so cool <laughs> for me and um and stuff so i've seen it just kind of panned up as like another attempt at legalize it he's trying to you know pull from the like you know the same same spot twice yeah um, like like uh, lightning in a bottle so to speak yeah i don't think that's the case i think they're both complementary of peter's overall v uh, point of why legalization is important uh, legalize it i think also carries in the vein of more playful at times you know goats like to play with it i've always joked with my dad that at that point he just needed another verse so he's like all right let me talk about the animals i guess birds <laughs> eat it <laughs> ants love it goats love to play with it and stuff and this one's much more this one's like you know these this is the like the hypocrisy of the system you know, this is why I want to smoke it. And then this is what will happen when it's legalized. Right. It will it will build up your failing economy. There will be no more police brutality. Um, again, also on the um, remaster version two, the long version, I really love a Bush Doctor. And I think it right. should have been the long version because there's even more of the better, Richard's. Yeah. Yeah, there's more of Keith Richards' guitar solo, which is great on this. Mm -hmm. um, what I really love about Keith's playing is it's not, he doesn't have to be all, you know, shredding to show off or show his skill. It's very, right. it's mellow, but skillful uh, um, solo during yeah. Bush Doctor. Um, right. But what I really love is the verse that's submitted um, on the long version um, I'd wow. be interested to hear what your guys' thoughts on this version of them how to get a beating because it's definitely cleaner, it's more polished, um, and I like it for sure. I love Peter's wah guitar on it. Um, I don't know how I feel about the female vocalists on it. I think it makes it a little too pretty. <laughs> I think it's just because of the fact that it's slower. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really match the 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 song. Uh, as well as the original Joe Gibbs right. version, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I guess it's my turn now. <laughs> yeah, you know me. Yeah. I like to keep it. And and also the original versions, Waylon Solom too, as a Whalers release. Joe Gibbs came after the fact. So that's the second of three. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that correction. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another 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 rarity, but I, no, I definitely re remember hearing hearing as such. Yeah, I I definitely like that version. It the 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 original or the the one from Joe Gibbs, the definitive uh 
rendition of Joe Gibbs definitely still, uh, you know, reigns supreme. But he, they definitely made an amazing. Uh, they, they definitely made a strong version for this one. The the background vocalist. See, what one thing I always make note of is there's a difference between background vocalists and harmony vocalists. The I three, no disrespect whatsoever to the 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 female vocalists who are on this album, but we know we hear musicians. You know, you know the deal between heart like harmony and vocal. The I threes were a harmony trio. You felt the harmony all the way through. The the cistern here more veered, veered more toward the toward, toward uh the toward background vocals. I mean, you, you heard a harmony, but they didn't harmonize as uh, the, the the blend wasn't there. It it's, right. it seemed more stiff, and the, and that's what you're hearing right there. So right. you know, it, and and it didn't blend enough with the with the with the message of them. Them have to get a beating. It, it it didn't it, it didn't go as well. You're talking about them have to get a beating. It's not meant to be pretty. <laughs> exactly. Bush Doctor could have been an amazing double album. If because you know what's one thing also that I remember even Roger in the Ooh. like in real time is asking Peter, how did Lesson in My Life not make the cut? Lesson in My Life, the single Thank version, you. is amazing. And it feels like it's from equal rights too, the kind of uh, more um percussive forward and just kind of stripped down the clove and the lead guitar style. It's not my main thing with Bush Doctor keeping me, me from loving it a huge amount is just it's over polished for me. It's a little bit too pretty with the overall production and mix. And um, it's missing a little bit more of a raw roots feel. The, the, fir the first thing that came to my mind, why the hell did indeed they put the rendition of uh, Don't Look Back on there? Number of things come to mind. Obviously, it was a marketing thing. It yeah. was a marketing thing. Think, think about it. Peter Tosh meets the Rolling Stones. Boom, he's on their label. It, it's, it's, it's huge. That's huge. That's big news alone. Then I thought about something else. The first and foremost thing that people are going to notice about this song is it's, it's barely reggae at all. It, 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 it is the beginning, ultimately, of, of what I call the cowboy reggae style. The, the clip the clippity clop clip clop, like, clip, uh, clop. Uh, i know the drum the drum beat is so different from other stuff i like it um but it's different it's like the that's sly that that was sly's right that that, yeah. that that is sly's thing but 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 and we've heard it in, in other other you know, tracks down, down the road but you notice how very particularly uh, it, this one, out of all the out of all the cowboy style tracks that that Sly had 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 done, or anyone else tried to execute, this particular one stands out. Th this particular one stands out. It literally sounds more like like everything else that 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 Sly doing his to to. This one sounds like like cowboy reggae. If if you could, if you could call it reggae at all, and so be, because and it's so extra bright. And it and it does and it doesn't swing the same way in, in you know again like I said in comparison to future or other songs in which uh, Sly did a, did a uh, like with Black Uhuru you know what I mean my thing is okay we put this at the beginning that's just to get this out of the way yeah let's get this let's get this out of the because I would have ultimately preferred that it be the first song on the B side as a as a middle as a gap you know what I mean. That that would have made that would have actually made it better for the listeners, technically speaking. Oh, by the way, I uh, have this one at uh, four. We haven't we haven't mentioned "Pick Myself Up." I don't think, but "Pick Myself Up." I love the recording of this. Lo love that love that song. Yeah, that that that, wa that waste of time part. I I would definitely read it into his, not necessarily. Not, not even not even so much his time with the whalers I, but uh I, i'm thinking of but how he was looking forward to breaking out and doing his own thing because obviously we know of his solo efforts during uh during his time with the whalers 
right and uh and, and his solo efforts and you know and how you said earlier that uh he, he was frustrated with the industry uh, you, you know so yeah. That's that really, that, may, that, yeah. may, that in itself may may attribute to that line right there. I've I've never thought about any of this with pick myself up, and that's really interesting for sure. Also, I yeah. think an interesting story with pick myself up that I've heard Peter and Herbie Miller share on different accounts is mm-hmm. that there was there was someone who uh, lost his whole family in a plane uh, crash in 1978, uh, and he is totally suicidal. And, oh wow totally down you know he's at the end of it and he's walking by a music store in their plane pick myself up and he mm. went in played the record he said like till it went white almost just was mm. playing that track and basically that kept him going and he met peter later on and i think gave him a like a, a, a some kind of sculpture or something as a gift but wow. that's just that's the power of peter and pick myself up and just the opening line of that of that song in itself is is uh, is so much it is it, is just enough to touch to, to to touch the heart and inspire at the same time the one love peace concert this is a story i didn't even know for a really long time we know peter made his speeches played his songs and later on was br- brutalized by the police for about 90 minutes i mean barely left alive and it's only because he learned to roll his eyes into the back of his head to look dead they said they could see his brain muscles moving i mean he, and then they put him in prison they you know they kept they held him bob bailed him out with um i think it's carlton smith of the tamlins the mm. two of them went together to see peter in the jail cell immediately after Carlton said Bob was like shouting outside the jail cell to tell him, leave Peter alone. No one can get out. No one can get in. They finally let Bob in. And Bob goes up to Peter, is consoling him. And Peter looks up and he's crying. And Bob pays the bail to get him out. Those are those are brothers. That's, that's Those are bonds, man. How can you hear that story and think the two of them had such a strong disliking of each other. The other story of Peter is at the, at, um, it's I think the Starlight um, in California. Bob's okay. playing, Peter's a guest, and Get Up Stand Up is being performed. Peter walks on stage right as mm-hmm. his verse starts, gets the mic and starts singing his verse. You know, the majority of the crowd doesn't know what's happening. Roger was there. Roger's like, people aren't realizing what's happening. And I'm jumping up and down and pointing, yelling, that's Peter Tosh. That's Peter Tosh. He's on stage right now and freaking out. And, you know, I mean, there's other celebrities. There's Mick Mick Jagger's back there afterwards. uh, I think it's the story is Bob goes up, claps his hand, and Peter says, the Pope felt that one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The Pope Pope (laughs) couldn't feel that one. Well, I remember one thing he said. He came to me and he clapped my hand and I said to him, no, he held out his hand like this and I clapped his hand and I said, Pope, feel that one. (laughs) Well, three days later, the Pope died. It's a little shaky because Peter's singing his version at this point, his live version, the more rocky rocking yeah, yeah. version and you can tell the the band is trying to kind of keep up with him and kind of improvise as they're going but what's really really cool is peter and bob doing the woyos together and with the audience and stuff i mean that's just so cool and i feel like this whole period of 78 is completely overlooked when talking about the relationship between bob and peter it's what's crazy is too in a slash magazine interview the day of they're saying, you know, have you talked with Bob much? And that's when he's like, you know, Bob's not in Jamaica when I'm in Jamaica, but he's in town tonight. And maybe I might even go up and sing, get up, stand up with him. So they have that interview the day of, and he, you know, keeps true with that thought. And I mean, we're, I mean, we're lucky that's recorded. I mean. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's but, man. We have Mystic Man. Mystic man, indeed. 
I, I really had to think about it because I, I, I said, this, this one could be number one. But I thought about it some more and I thought about it some more. And it ended up as number four. Um, but when we were talking about the, the female vocalist on Bush Doctor, mm -hmm. well, this is when the Tamlins come in. Because uh, I don't even think that they're on a single track of Bush Doctor. That is my favorite harmony group. Uh, and it's not because of their catalog, because they have a very small catalog. Right. It's just based off of their harmonies alone. Right. There's no other group that has that sound that the Tamlins have. They have this sort of sharpness to their vocal when, when the three of them blend, you know? Right. Yeah. And put to Peter's music, it's absolutely dynamite. My favorite Peter Tosh song is on this album, which is Just Say No. Mm. It's a great song. And you hear, you hear the Tamlins on that one? Yeah. Peter is singing, too. At the end there, too, he's, like, pushing it. He's pushing his range, and yeah. like you can tell he's feeling he's in the in the in the mood with that one. We were talking about disco earlier. <laughs> this is the one that's got the disco track on it, which is Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace, right? Yeah. My gosh, if you hear the arrangement on that one, there's just so much to it. And then you know, disco songs are are known, you know, to be like long play six, seven, eight minutes. And this one, right. eight minutes, 47 seconds. Uh, also, just, just something to point out, the horn arrangements were done by Clive Hunt. It says, it says oh, Mikey right. Chung and Clive Hunt, but if anyone who knows anything about Clive Hunt, he was and is one of Jamaica's top producers. Top producers. He sure. produced, I'll give one example of what he produced because it is one of the most important albums in the history of recording, which is Sata Masagana by the Abyssinians. There you go. He produced that whole album. And the horns on The Day the Dollar Die. Mm. You see, that one, when I heard just the beginning of that one, I was taken aback because that intro is so different. Even yeah. compared to Buckingham Palace, it's so different. You know? Uh, so here's my highlights of it. Recruiting mm -hmm. Soldiers, Can't You See, Whaler's remake. Right. Mm -hmm. Of course, Just Say No, Buckingham Palace. Mystic Man is also at number four for me. And it was close to being number two or number three and it just happened to end up finalizing at the number four spot and i kind of couldn't believe it when i saw it i was like whoa how'd this get to number four um one thing okay so i'll start with what you were saying with the uh, the day of the dollar die yeah in this album amazing intros composed by peter i mean the intro to joss say no the the spooky start to it with the keyboards and everything it, and then the starting lines must rasta bear this cross alone and all the heathens go go free i mean that the intro to that song there's some of it on bush doctor but this is where we again see peter's continued um expression and experimentation with the music one thing i noticed too when i was re-listening to it is the percussion on this album really shines through the through the bongos, the Nyabingi drums, or cowbell that's being played throughout mm. is really interesting, especially on Buckingham Palace, where it's like just kind of like the <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, it's just simple things. It's like I'm a percussionist, so obviously I, I you know, I look for and and can hear and appreciate yeah. the percussion, but it just sticks out with this album. And also, much like how survival is Bob's answer to the critics with Kaya, this is a heavy hitter coming from Bush Doctor, even more, more so. 
I mean, you have all of these songs. I mean, Can't You See is really the only love song. And even that, it's a it's a bitter, yeah, pop, like you know, sharp. <laughs> it's more it's more on like this is like what he would be singing to the girl before writing brand new secondhand. <laughs> 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 but um but yeah so the percussion um i really love peter's wawa on on this especially on rumors of war during the little break yeah. of like the wuka, 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 and and stuff like that and uh um really love the keyboards too the keyboard intros and the overlays and um things like that it really are are good. I just really love the the overall mix of the album, and I also think it handles it's mixed better and presented better than Bush Doctor. It's not as sleek and polished. I'd love to hear the story with the name, the writing of it, the Buck in Ham. It's totally Peter's wordplay. I just it just seems like a general like he's just disrespecting it on purpose. Like yeah, I'm not gonna write out its full title, but it's just so interesting. You know, because people don't seem to really discuss how it's written. They're just like, oh, yeah, Buckingham Palace. But I feel like it just shows, again, Peter's wordplay with it all. I also thought with Buckingham Palace, have you guys heard the vocal mistake on it? On which one? Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace. I've heard it before. And just, I think, earlier today, I was like, this is a mistake, I think. Right mm. before music and herb is the healing of the nation, there's like a fault a, a, a um earlier take that comes in and gets cut off right before the final mm. take. It's like didn't it's like and cuts off. It's a That's hard one to catch because it sounds almost percussive in some ways. Like mm -hmm. you might not yeah. know it's vocal at first, but it totally is. But that is, yeah, you could tell it's yeah, it's it's a it's a voice. Especially yeah. Peter's voice. The my best, my favorite tracks are. I love recruiting soldiers. Um, I love the train whistle, the um, percussion there, and um, oh, also going with Buckingham Palace. It's interesting because in the live versions, Robbie does the um, oh, what is it called? But it's the Buckingham Palace music. The don 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 don. Don't, 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 don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the big, big, ben. big ben, uh, ben. Yeah, Big Ben. He does yeah. the Big Ben um, um, sound at the beginning yeah. of Buckingham Palace. So it's like, don't, 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 and stuff. And that's cool for live versions. Um, but yeah, Recruiting Soldiers, Can't You See? I love Josh Say No, um, Buckingham Palace, and I, I really... It's weird. I ended up like, I like all of them on here. I mean, I like Mystic Man too, um, but I really, I really like, I love Crystal Ball. And I love, I forget again the instrument you told me it was, but the ooh. Oh, ooh, the uh, Quika drum. Yeah, I love, I love that on there. Uh, Mystic Man uh, is a uh, number six uh, ranking for me. Uh, not, not quite, not quite as as strong as uh as as bush doctor but um also that's funny you said that because i i, I was i said earlier that <laughs> bush doctor wasn't the strongest <laughs> <laughs> right but it's but, the toughest uh, uh, there you go <laughs> not quite the toughest but uh yeah no so so we have um yeah definitely crucial the yeah, de definitely crucial points. Uh, uh, just say no. Fight on. I think fight like, on oh, too. Yeah, yeah. I completely forgot about fight on. Fight on. Be because because reggae disco has uh, has always been somewhat a has always been a a bullet point of I guess you could say mild controversy among reggae lovers, reggae heads, in in terms of noting these one offs. With for for many of these acts, only only very there's only only li literally a ha less than a handful who have classic tunes from the from the original era 
you know, would stand out. And obviously, Third World and uh, Bob Marley uh, uh, definitely stand out in that regard. And Peter Tosh himself uh, with uh, this one. Now, a lot of people may not necessarily regard it as much as the other two, but as far as the lore, the the, the legacy of Peter Tosh, Buckingham Palace has, has been one of the most talked about uh, for God knows how many different reasons and uh, for good uh, you know, for for good reason, it's like he he does it again. He make he 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 fl he flips into reggae disco, and you still feel the pe you you still feel his uh, his, his might. As far as a mystic man is concerned, you, you know you know the one of the greatest standouts uh, standout elements of this uh, album is actually the cover. Aside from the fact that uh, you know Peter smiling on, on on a unicycle and not that that that's that that's memorable enough as it is but do you notice where he's um exactly where he's unicycling in front of yeah you see you you mentioned this a long time ago and i didn't even know mm. i don't know i don't think that my friend is the world trade center yeah whoa yeah Ends with rumors of war. Not even. Oh, didn't didn't quite think about that. I was thinking more as to the day he was murdered. True, that too. Yeah, yeah. How did I not think? The date that? he was murdered, I should say. Yeah, yeah. In the day, the date of nine eleven. I know th there's a lot of different tie-ins too. Yeah, with the different people. And it's a it's an interesting one for sure. The the but but a huge standout from the Mystic Man album was his rendition of "Can't You See." Yeah, that was yeah. a big standout. Yeah, he totally. went complete rock on that one <laughs> and nailed it. Oh boy, <laughs> he no no seriously, it, it's it's one thing to. Like to really go out the box, but it's like no, no. See, you you listen to him. He, his voice is is between himself and he's channeling like Neil Diamond, and uh, and something. He's really going in on this one. If if, if 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 it's almost as if this was his, it was his dream. Like he thought of doing a rock song at some point before, yeah. and so he decided to take this one. And, and and again, just really make it out to be. I mean, the the, orig the original one is a masterpiece with, with, with the whalers, you know. But yeah. and that is what it is, and that that's that's reggae. It's but this remake. one, yeah. But <laughs> but this remake as as a, as a rock joint, and he you could tell he's having so much fun. I thought just the placement of the tracks is really interesting at track four and five where Joss Say No fades out on Peter saying, set the captives free, and then starts on Fight On with his chanting of Africa's got to be free, and then goes into Fight On. Yeah. So I think that's just a cool thing hearing back to back. Wanted, Dread, and Alive. Wanted, Dread, and Alive. This is, this is that album that you have to have a deluxe edition for. Oh, yeah. Truly deep and yeah. a half. This because is the only the, the only album from all from all the whalers that have ever gotten this treatment. So there's two different versions of this album. The UK version has the tracks Rock With Me, Oh Bumba Clot, and Guide Me for My Friends. And the US version has The Poor Man Feel It, Cold Blood, and that's what they will do. But they, they omit Rock With Me and Bumble Clot, right? Yeah, yeah, they're not on there. It, it's one thing we cl clearly we know why the why Old Bumble Clot didn't make it onto uh, uh, in the in the U.S. I'm all, I'm pretty surprised to many degree, and I imagine many others are also surprised that it actually made it on the U.K. Uh, version. And wait, I don't think it made it on the Jamaican uh, press either. Old Bumble Clot. Yeah, I think the I think the Jamaican one is the same as the U.S. 14 years after he's been gone and it's just been just now is actually put together and i'm surprised i haven't heard in interviews him talking about it because 
it would seem like something Peter would be absolutely pissed off about, too. Yeah, but then I'm also thinking again because that's three songs that are that are excluded, and I've noticed the majority of Peter's albums are nine tracks, right? With the exception of of two, which is Equal Rights and and uh, No Nuclear War, but the majority right. of his albums have nine tracks. If you were to add on those three, that would be a twelve track album, right? Fair enough. So Neville Garrick again. Yeah. And you notice on the back cover, there's fingerprints. And he wanted to get Peter's actual fingerprints on there. And Peter was being stubborn about it. He didn't it. want Bobby Lons to know his fingerprints. Yeah. So those are Neville Garrick's fingerprints. Yeah. That's such mm. a cool story. And, and I, I just makes perfect sense. You say it. I think you'll I think I think you're gonna say, it. go ahead. I just love the info on the sheet yep. itself. Sergeant Lucifer is the person who has arrested him and it is the date is from 76 to Ooh. the year he released legalize it and the offenses numerous <laughs> which is just funny i didn't even spot the sergeant lucifer part until today <laughs> <laughs> i thought for the longest time this was just kind of like the old western pattern behind him but he's actually in front of a big boulder yeah. in the photo shoot, which is cool. Yeah. There's some really great outtakes, too, from this photo session that have yet to be seen because Neville hasn't put them out. Mm -hmm. No no doubt. No doubt. It's clearly one of his most iconic uh, album covers. Absolutely. And it's number one on my list. Ah. <laughs> and I thought it was going to be Mystic Man, and I thought it was going to be Mama Africa. Huh. And I was listening back to this one. It is so good. And the Tamlins shine the most on, on like, Poor Man Feel It. That is the best one. That That's the best one that, that the Tamlins did it's with Peter. Incredible. Yeah. Those oohs that they, that they do at the, at the beginning of it. It, it makes the, you know, the hair on my arm stand up. It's just that right. damn, it's that damn good. No, I was going to ask, this one is a bit tricky because, um, to, to a degree, because would you, how, how would you gauge the, the, the position from the UK version or the US version? Both. Before, before, before <laughs> combining everything. Okay. For me, for I, me how, I'm, how I'm doing it is I'm just omitting the, the long mixes at the end of the Definitive from Master. I'm taking all 12 tracks. Okay, so you're taking all, all, all tracks yeah. and then just leaving out the uh, yeah. extras. Okay. Because I feel like if that that was that would be the definitive way that Peter would have released it. Still, it is the same album. Right. Just with the exception of three tracks. But still the same album. So if you have the UK or the US version, either one, the tracks That's are the still end. solid and it's still number one, you know. Here's another thing to point out. This is what also launched Gwen Guthrie's career. So Gwen Guthrie was already recording as, as like a session vocalist. Her, her credits go all the, uh, as far back as I think 1972. And as her career really began to pick up, particularly in 83, 84, she, she ended up working with Sly and Robbie. Yeah. And it was, and it, was a big, it was a big hit, uh, Padlock, right there. Padlock. That song is freaking awesome. This is, as far as I know, the first track where she's singing lead with Peter, which is Nothing But Love. Nothing But Love. Uh-oh. Yep. Oh, crap. Oh, you, you, got, you got a 45 of that. Oh, yeah, my God. Nothing But Love on EMI America, EMI uh, America with the Stones no, label no. still, and uh, with a flip of Oh Bumba Clot. Mm-hmm. So, so it did? this is okay. EMI America. So the U.S. got it after all. Did, yeah. I don't know where to begin or where to end with this one. <laughs> because this is the first and only time that there's a song like this on a Peter Tosh album. Right. Yeah. And, and, a, and a duet at that. One, once I saw it myself, ch 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 checking it for the first time, I was like, no, no, I had to hear this. I never heard of it before my, uh, uh, landing a 
well, not even lending a copy. I actually borrowed it. And it's not written by Peter either. So again, another rare right. exception. Most mm-hmm. of his stuff is. Thank, thank you for reminding me of that. That that was the other thing about it. It, it. it was like this is a duet with Peter and Peter Tosh and Gwen Guthrie of all people before she got before she got famous. And it's and it's written by other people. When it comes to singers like that from that time, they all stood out in their own way. You could tell them yes. apart. Unlike now, where everyone it, it all it all just sort of meshes into each other everyone does that same style, style. of singing right gwen's no, no, voice no is gwen's voice is amazing absolutely fantastic i can't yeah. i can't i at times I'm, i can't believe how amazing her voice was you know and i'm so glad they have the long version of it too so you can hear it even more with peter yeah, as they kind of do their ad libs and kind of rambling on at the end and stuff. It's yeah, it's a great collab. It's a great collab for sure. What's really cool is I'm assuming you've both seen the original version of what this was intended to be on the tree. It's meant to be a poster nailed onto a tree, but Neville didn't do yeah. the right album dimension, so they had to shrink it into just the oh. poster itself. Oh, um, but okay. they used it for promotional posters and some touring posters. So it got out there in some way, but um, I, I really, I've always loved this album. It's always been, you know, it, I used to have it as my number one, just internally. Um, and then I just, you know, I started appreciating equal rights even more coming back to it later on. Um, but this is my number two. Like I said, each album has a different feel to it. Like, I feel like that's how you, you, you can tell in a best of compilation or so, even if you were new to Peter, I feel like you could tell that these are all from different eras when they're all put together, especially yeah. when it's, when it's fully full with and Santa versus Sly and Robbie, of course, um, or if it's a uh, family man and Carly versus Sly and Robbie, things like that. But just the overall feel to the songs and the mixes and stuff. Um, I love coming in hot. And I've Roger, I I know Roger's talked about before. How is coming in hot not the lead single that was promoted everywhere? This could have been huge in like the dance halls and in everything. I mean, it's it's it has everything it needs. The bass line, the drums, Peter's delivery, the song subject line itself. It's it's totally a double meaning song with you know using um the the true story of him having like a 104 degree fever and having to mm. use uh medicinal leaves that he put on his chest to abstract the the heat and mm. but then also using the uh the gun metaphor as uh musical shots from word sound and power and i just i love i love it it's a song that i've covered with my band before it's just it's the perfect keeping it peter but also it's like it's just a nice one to enjoy yourself nothing but loves awesome um i know roger questioned peter he puts himself in situations that i don't think i could ever put myself in to peter's face he's like this is an r&b record this isn't reggae like what and peter's explained yeah. himself but the thing is they're friends so they're able to have this intellectual conversation where roger or peter's like you know i'm the architect of reggae and i can take my formula and put it in different molds and shape it in different ways and it's still reggae and as an architect of reggae i don't tell a shoe cobbler how to make his shoes or something (laughs) like that (laughs) and uh but it's still everything with peter's like you know if he's going into disco if he's going into r&b if he's going into rock there's still the foundation of reggae and i feel like peter maybe more so than any other artist showed that the underlying reggae heartbeat rhythm is in all music if you look for it hard enough reggae my light is again it's one of the one of the first times since legalize it where you kind of get that playful um, you know, that Word playfulness list. of Peter within the yeah. song. One of my favorite parts ever since I was younger is the uh, went to the doctor to find out the matter. Doctor said, son, you have reggae myelitis. I say, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I crack up at it every time. And it's, so, I mean, it's him having fun with it. And you can tell this is like his love letter to the genre that he's been performing his whole life. 
one thing I also like, you're talking about the Tamlins too. What's really interesting too is how Peter's like the highest of the highs though in the backing for this whole album. And you can hear it because also it's like, whoa, this sounds like some Whaler stuff. And you hear it's Peter doing his, his very high up backing vocals with the Tamlins. But it's so, uh, Porn Man Feel It and Reggae My Lias, I think, are the two. Um, because how they do the, it's in, a, it's in a my blood, yeah, and stuff like that. Right. It's not just the straight delivery. And, and, and also my favorite part of it, I think, is at the end as it's fading out, how it's in my heart, in my soul, in my mind. mouth, registered in my brain. I mean, it's such a cool fade out line. And I, I love Reggae My Lias. I really like rock with rock with me too. And what's interesting, I can't yeah, believe I left that one out. Yeah, rock with me <laughs> is what was the original one? Rock sweet rock. Is that what it's titled? Yes, 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 yes. So this is oh again God. a Whalers remake, but it's Bunny on lead. Bunny so, was on lead on the original, yes. But the thing is, with the pattern, Peter only sings you know, what's his songs, really, unless it's a duet. So does that mean it was, like, co-written between the two? Because I think, is this the period where Bob's in Delaware? 66, July, yeah. July 66. Yeah, yeah, because they, they were not they were not at Studio One in 67. So so that, that was the giveaway right there. And Bob's not there. It, it, yeah, he's not, he's, not, he's not on the track. Great. Yeah, it's with Vision. Um, and it's interesting. It's same with Till Your Well Runs Dry and Don't Look Back. So... Um, several remakes later on were just with Bunny and Peter in Vision. The dub version of this that still hasn't been released outside Jamaica, it's only on the B-side of the Jamaican release of Rock With Me. It's so good. It, just, it drops down to just the dun 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 dun, dun bass line, and then it has like occasional like piano playing, and then like the horns on it, are, the horns on this whole album are really great. And um, Oh, Bumbleclaw, of course, is, you know, I think it, what seems to be kind of a fan favorite be, just because of how rebellious it is of, uh, mm. you know, how dare he even try a yeah. song like that. What did he mean at the end when he says under section three? I've always wondered that, too. I thought he was intentionally leaving a vocal command while conducting the band or the backup mm. singing. I thought he was mm. saying on to section three. Okay. But I don't know. That would be a really interesting thing to hear from anyone in the studio. Um, Want to Dream Alive is a really great title track. And what's interesting, too, is it borrows lyrics from Keep On Moving. And Rastafari is especially live, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But, mm. oh, my gosh. I, even, even though on the studio recording, it's really powerful, and especially how it fades out on just the, the harmony with Peter at the lead, at the high note of it, which is the Lord of Lords and Savior and fading out. Also, what's interesting is a little bit of like studio info for that track. There's an additional guitar solo that gets cut from the final version. So that's still in the vaults. Fools Die, again, Peter ex using his experimentation, I think showing again why, how the genre he's, you know, I can see why he's calling himself an architect, you know, not only just because of his deep ties to reggae at the beginning of it, at the source with the whaler, but I mean, he's put, continuing to push it every album. There's some song that pushes the boundaries of it more. And it, it, except that this, except that this one is just having it on a reggae the, album though, not necessarily the song itself, but just right. showing at the, now I would say, the definitive version for me would be playing Fool's Die at the very end of all of it. Yes. There's, yes. there's no way it go. It just, that's the ending track. I'm assuming that's just Peter on electric keyboard too. Yeah. Because in, it's very again, much in the vein of creation yeah. too. But you could, you could tell that it, when it comes to anything that's on keyboard, you can tell when it's Peter because right. Peter has this unique way of it, it, when when he does the stabs, it's it's different. Oh, I completely forgot to tell him Bush Doctor, but we can keep it here. Bush yeah. Doctor, a really cool thing about Bush Doctor on creation is that's all Peter's tape machine, tape player. He went out and physically recorded those sound effects. 
Uh, he woke up early in the morning to get to the rooster in time to record yeah. it. He went down to the to um, the stream to record the water flowing. That's all right. him putting those sounds together. And uh, then so connecting that to Poor Man Feel It, I don't know if you both know this. I feel like, Zeb, I had to have mentioned it maybe to you. But the baby cry is Jawara, his youngest son. Peter oh. taped, taped him and uh, put it onto the track when it's uh, the baby hungry. Oh, Nia- you know, Niambi, she was only like five years old when Peter died. So she really was robbed of that opportunity. And Jawara was only a couple years older or so. And mm. so we don't hear much about, you know, the parent side of, of Peter. And so whenever you see that kind of rare image of, of him, especially, you know, when, you know, it was really unfortunate with Jawara, you know, was killed yeah. and passed away. Um, you know, you got to hear from, from Melody for really the first time. I mean, I don't, I have never really seen Melody talk much about, you know, Peter or anything, but you got to hear some family stories and, you know, about her, her story of raising these young kids now on her own once Peter died and, and things like that. But you also from Dave Tosh, she's the one who shared that he was put on babysitting duties for Jawara when, when they would be around. So Dave, uh, one of the older sons would watch Jawara and he's the one who confirmed that Peter taped Jawara crying to use on the poor man feel it. So it, it's, you know, it's just kind of, especially with the two of them, you know, both of them gone now. It's it's a sweet little kind of thing to think yeah. about. It kind of makes me smile when I hear it. I feel the and the emotion that Peter's conveying in cold blood. I I feel scared when I hear it. It's the Tamlins are scary on this track. Like all of a sudden when Peter just fades out as the you know scary judge and you just hear every time I see like you start yep. feeling in you like. Yep. I, I get freaked out in the, in the, <laughs> and it's and it's cool. And I, I what's funny is kind of there's slight differences, but Peter doesn't really change his voice much between the right. judge and just him yeah. as a defendant. So it's kind of funny sometimes figuring out, oh wait, no, that is the judge saying that because he puts a little bit of an arrogant talk ending with that's what they will do to um again, same with the uh, guy me from the friend from my friends. Again, it's also a weird it's an interesting chord progression that feels different than most Peter tracks. And um, I like the um, the light guitar work over, over the beginning of the intro to it. And uh, I think the Tamlins on the back in there again sound, I mean, they sound awesome on this whole thing, but I think uh, Poor Man Feel It, that's what they will do. And Reggae My Light is they really shine extra. Uh, in- incidentally, you've covered a lot of the same ground where I'm, uh, where I'm concerned on on the songs. You know, uh, <laughs> a lot, a lot of ground. I have it as uh, number five, but but the others, the 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 others in in underneath that in the, in the top five, like seriously, really really tough to not to get away from a certain higher position. It's it's a it's a feel good album. Just overall, it's definitely a feel good album. Now, of course, I I was more privy to the uh, to the U.S. Uh, release, but of course, once we got to those other tracks, Oh Bumble Clot, fire! Oh, oh man! It, it, and definitely good that that at least it did get some shine in the. Uh, you know, in in the U.S., you know, it, it made it to the single, so so that's so that's boss. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what what else am I missing? I'm just trying to remember the, the other tracks. Uh, let me see. Oh, uh, rock with me. You know, the the original one way better, but I love the fact that he that that he went that he that he decided to revisit this. For, for for this album, it's it's a it's an it's an it's a it's a nice it's a nice remake. That's that's what they will do, man. You you, you just get a sense of uh of environment out of that one. Not just for it's another thing from the title alone makes you want to hear, and 
and th- there it is. And uh, so now getting back to Rastafari is, and and then fools die. So th- so that that's when we get to the particularly uh, spiritual tunes, and um, it, it's it's uh, it, it seems almost like uh, like a pattern in itself. Start f- from particularly from when he. From when he when he uh, got signed to Rolling Stones, you, you kind of noticed that with uh, just about all those, uh, although yeah, no, re- no, literally all those three albums, because it doesn't because he doesn't really go there with, with Mama Africa, if you notice, you know, with that that kind of uh, that kind of contemplative, real deep thought style of spiritual track, you, you know what I mean? Fools die. Now the fact the fact that he went back to that, which most people at this time clearly did not know at all that that was that the whalers that that, that it was a whalers tune. The, those Ted Pounder uh, uh, produced tracks were among the most obscure of of the catalog, but at at this particular time. Uh, but but the but the fact that he did it the way he did it. That that is that is enough to break you down, Mama Africa. Nineteen eighty-three, oh, yeah. and this is when he's on EMI. Period. Period. Yeah, this one is number three, and it would be number two, but I'll get to that when we reach okay. what is what is number two. Brilliant piece of work. And this is when, this is when, Sly and Robbie are on a couple of tracks on this, but this is when Santa and Foley uh, come into the picture on recording. This the, yeah, this is the new lineup. The new lineup of Word, Sound, and Power. Um, with Steve Golding, too. With Steve Golding, yep. Has Keith Sterling been on it, right? Keith, yeah, yeah. Keith is always, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it was, it used to be Keith and Robbie Lynn, and then Robbie Lynn, uh, Left, right. uh, Donald, yeah. Donald is still new. He came on in Dread and Alive, I think, as more of a full on member because, like, he joined Peter on the tour for Legalize It. And I think he might have done some touring for Equal Rights. Um, like, he joined Peter on the tours, it seemed like. But I feel like Wanted Dread and Alive, as far you know, as far as my memory serves me. Once you're in live and Mama Africa kind of solidifying him as just a full on word sound and power recording member as well. Yeah, because Mikey Mikey Chung was with yeah, him during then, yeah seven yeah, years. Yeah, and then uh, is it right. yeah right. Daryl Thompson? I, I'm so shocked. Want to drive alive? Mystic Man haven't already been repressed. They're the only one since 2002, and even 2000, 2002 doesn't even count. It was such a obscure run of vinyl. You're not gonna find those anywhere. What's really interesting, for the longest time, I thought this was Neville Garrett mm. um, because it felt like it would make sense. He did want to drain alive in a nuclear war, so it makes sense that the middle one was also him. But this is not Neville Garrett, and I'd love to talk with him and, and discuss, did Neville make a pitch and Peter just preferred this one? And, because that's what happened with Legalize It. Neville made a concept for Legalize It but they went mm. with the Lee Jaffe photo. Neville Garrick wanted to make it a newspaper headline saying legalize it. Um, ah, right, and, right. Uh, but so, yeah, so it's for, he's done the Bush Doctor writing on some releases of Bush Doctor. He did Want to Dread Alive and No Nuclear War, but Mervyn uh, Palmer. Mervyn Palmer, uh, yeah. 1982. And it's interesting, mm-hmm. he fully dates it. It's August 21st, 1982, when he did this. Co- cover, cover truly stands out, not only on account of what it is, you can see it right there, but also because it is a clear reflection of the sentiment of the song. Th- there's no doubt that the, the tears coming from Mama's yeah. eyes, Mama Africa's yeah. eyes, the joy it's, in yeah. Peter's face, man. It, it's 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 one of the greatest... Uh, yeah. Uh, pieces of art ever, ever ever constructed and then we have not gonna give it up yes and this is when peter does the the bass vocal it, it, I, 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 yes. I love that part because you can oh. find, that's it's so great 
I love that part. Yeah. It's the whole song. It's that whole song is fantastic. And, and going back to the saxophone on there at the at the beginning. Yeah. Then there's Stop That Train. And you said that that was from the Mystic Man sessions? That's what um one of the guitarists for Mystic Man said, and that he um he's on this recording just uncredited. Now, Johnny be good. Now that Okay, that was the song that broke him big here in the U.S. Yeah. Yep. And you know something? No mm. matter how popular it is, mm. I could never get tired of that song. Yeah. That's right. I'm complete. Yep. Anyone who knows the original knows how it sounds and how it's arranged. This right. is its own thing. This is compl- This is not a cover almost. This is just this, taking this. This is like paying homage to it almost. Yeah. It's an original a cover but but an original they, 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 they basically they basically watch this sounded uh the the, the original oh if yeah, you know yeah. What I'm and um the, the thing is so donald donald brings the whole you know backing track because he was pitching it to peter peter didn't want to do it and donald you know convinced him and you know thank you donald for that because yeah. not only did it make a great song but it helped get peter up there even more the way the melody is, it has that same kind of rock ballad kind of hit to it. But then you have Where You Gonna Run, which was, again, Donald Kinsey again. Donald, yeah. He wrote and that it's song. Great. It's great, too. And I remember reading that it reminded Peter of Down Presser Man, and that's why he attached to it so much. And, I mean, that that's Donald writing, but, again, he's doing such a great job of catering it to Peter. I mean, this yeah. is if Donald didn't write it, Peter would have at some point, it feels like. Peace Treaty. Yes. Yeah. Remember I said, I can't believe I looked over this song for so long. Yeah. I, remember. I recall. And now it's my favorite track on there. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's a great rhythm to it. Yeah. Yes. And the, great, the, for, the cadence is unforgettable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And for those who don't know, the song is about the peace concert mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he was even though he performed there he he was totally against the concept of it because mm-hmm. i remember it was copeland forbes who said peter's terminology of peace meant death yeah because on your tombstone it says rest in peace he said that's the, the yeah yeah the, the diploma, diploma you get in the cemetery, cemetery. <laughs> don't feel no way it's always it's this one verse that i love the most out of it Cannot tell lie and hear truth. Cannot, Cannot live bad, bad and love good. Good. Cannot live up and get down. Cannot give a dollar and want a pound. I love the uh, um, cannot drink water and get drunk. Get cannot drunk. Drink whiskey, and, whiskey and, and, stay and stay sober. <laughs> love that one. Man. Yeah. I have Mama Africa at number five, uh, right behind Mystic Man. And uh, uh, I, I love this album. I feel like for a while, I listened to it so much that I started kind of getting a little tired of it in some ways. Mm-hmm. And I put it away for a long time and just always like, it's like, oh, I know exactly how it's going to sound. And I really recently um, listened to it again. And I was like, it's just the energy in this album. I mean, first, what a way, I mean, what a statement at the beginning, the eight minute title track at the beginning, the album, total African rhythm, guitars, every Again, this is the genre pushing or the boundary pushing you know even though it's cliche track on this is mama africa it's full-on you know african music and i i can't help but smile every time i listen to it because you have to listen to it all the way through you know i know it's a bonus track i'm never i'm never going to listen to the seven inch version by choice over the eight minute one because there's a reason it's eight minutes you know, he wouldn't have stretched it out that long if he didn't have that much to say. I've talked with Roger. It's been so long, too. Memories fade. Just because it's in the book doesn't mean someone actually has possession of it. It just means it was recorded at some point. Like, mm. in the, no, the whereabouts may be unknown. But there are two dub mixes to Mama Africa, the title track. It's the dub drums mix. And then there's also the girls mix. So th- both of those, I'm guessing one is heavily f- like um, 
heavily uh, uses the drums and percussion on it, or maybe it's just the percussion alone. And then the other one I'm guessing is the the female backing singer singers having a heavy emphasis on the dub. But I'd love to hear those at some point. The horn, the horn, especially Dean Frazier on the saxophone, it's it's great. And I love the the slide guitar. I love Peter's wah on it. The trippy effects on the end of Glass House too is something I like, I re-listened to recently and kind of, it's just now hit me. It's like, whoa, this is trippy at the end. Like they're fading it in and out, adding reverb and echo as he's adding like, uh, you know, adding another over overdub onto the, the main track and stuff. It's, it's really cool at the end. Stop That Train is, is interesting. I like it. It just, to me, doesn't come close to not just the student, not the, it's weird. It feels closer to the Beverly's uh, Best of the Whalers version mm-hmm. than the more recent one of Catch a Fire and, La- and um, Whalers Live. I feel like a song like Stop That Train, to me, feels almost untouchable after the Whalers version of it. And I feel like it just, I just, I love, I love that version a lot more. This one is a little bit too upbeat and, and jumpy. It's a good remake of a Whalers track. It just, to me, doesn't come close to touching the, the, uh, the previous one, the one in between that's kind of known as the definitive version. And then, uh, uh, oh, also Magadog, a remake of not only the Joe Gibbs version, but the original Whalers version. Which is interesting too. That's that's Peter's first lead on a on a Whalers track. So right. that's pretty cool seeing that he's remade it. And uh, where are you gonna run? I really love and I really love the performance of it on the David Letterman show during the tour. Yeah, um, that one's really cool. Not gonna give it up. Like I said earlier, it just it's gonna be done better on record. Uh, coming up but uh peace treaty i like i've also seen some critiques of peace treaty just kind of being peter's chance to openly boast for uh however many minutes about being right about stuff he said (laughs) but um i think feel no way is the total sleeped on track out of all of it we're talking about how like the best ones on exodus are the overlooked ones. And I feel like this one is severely overlooked in Peter's catalog. (sighs) Mama Africa for me is number three. That is, that is number three because it is clearly one. And I I told, I told you it was, it was, it was tough. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've been right. I've been rankling between equal rights, legalize it and Mama Africa as to which one will be in which place. Because Mama Africa is a superb album, absolutely hands down. Got, got it. Uh, when when we had it, we 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 had it when it was uh when, when it was released, when it was just when it was out. Caught me completely by surprise, really, really and truly, because I because uh, um you know I was you know really unaware as to what was coming out from who at the time this that and the third you know so this was uh, this was this was an experience for me and you know just so just taking everything in but it, but it's an experience i'll never forget from from beginning to end mama africa the the the, t- the title track very very emotional you know for for what it was worth it is the greatest one of the greatest compositions and uh, of that encompasses a celebration of of uh, of African pride and joy and the reunion a, a reunion of uh, the, the reunion with our you know to just imagine you know touching base with the with with, with the mother with, with the motherland and you know so it just being at home once again glass house excellent just 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 pure excellence and the 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 arrangement the verses you know th- th- this i'm telling you 
Number three, this is a hard place to put this album. I'm telling you. <laughs> Even as as you were talking, I, I I'd almost thought of flipping flipping places, but I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stand on it. But it's it's really that hard because because all of these because all of these songs all of these songs stand out every one of them is listenable from from beginning to end and here's the interesting but before i go any further remember what i said about uh the the difference between uh background vocals and harmony vocals particularly in terms of the females that were on bush doctor we got female harmony vocalists on this one not gonna give it up Enough said on that one. That, yeah. that power, power ballad right there. Uh, so, okay, so stop that train. That was that has always been a standout, as far as Whaler's tracks in 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 the Peter Peter Tosh legacy. That always stands out for some strange reason. There, there was the so clearly there was the original one with Beverly's. Mm -hmm. That was way more bouncy than yeah. you. You know, and more, you know, up uh, how, how you were describing it over here. You know, this one, this one was pretty, you know, taking a, um, and and then then there was the one, then there was the Catch a Fire version. That the it's Catch a like Fire a version, it's a ballad. Huh? Really, that one's like a ballad. Yeah, he he yeah they, they he made it, they they made it into a ballad when, when they dropped the when they dropped the 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 reggae groove and then they just made it more. Uh, contemplative, for for lack of better terminology, and yeah, that kind of that, that kind of threw me off a bit. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what they did on Catch a Fire, but it kind of threw me off a bit in contrast to those other two versions. Johnny B. Good, it's so, so self-explanatory. He he put the power, he he really put put the power on that one, made it his own. That's the best way to to cover a Chuck Berry song in reggae and make it your own and you know all thanks to to donald kinsey for uh for for, for that and words on and power and peter and oh boy it was just dynamite where you're gonna run definitely stands out for for 83 because disco technically was 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 really no longer around it it, it sort of fused to boogie it, it, it was it was now boogie but it, it it take it takes on that kind of groove clearly, <coughs> but uh, but definitely keeps that that reggae step, you know, and uh, but but it and it 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 doesn't overcomplicate uh, itself in any way, shape, form, or fashion as far as the fusions of it, you know. It's it, it's just it, it's very much straight to the point. It's danceable, but it's also it's it, but it's also with a message and it's straight to the point. And you can rock with it all the way. Feel no way, super power, super powerful. You use uh, definitely know for a fact, especially how much I how much I play that daggone tune. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I, it it was beyond intriguing. It was, yeah, you know. And then of course, then comes the third incarnation of Maga Dog, the second one as a solo artist, uh, right here. It, it was, uh, uh. Yeah, I, but which, by the way, I don't know if you know. I don't know if you know this or not. But uh, d did you, uh, Soul in particular? Did do you get? Um, do you did you do you happen to get brand new secondhand vibes out of this r version of Maga Dog? Yeah, in, in some ways, I feel like. Yeah. No. No. I mean, I'm not talking about in. Oh well, actually, I guess you could say about the lyrical content, but I wasn't even thinking as much in, in uh, uh, the lyrical content as much as even though there is a there are some slight similarities, but I'm referring to the the vi the vibe that you get from listening to it being remade as it as as it was, you know. Oh yeah, it's. It's and 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 all and also and also showing up as the last track on each album. You notice that too. Oh wait, one more thing. Uh, going back to not gonna give it up because you mentioned um, uh, the uh, Peter as uh, emphasizing his bass. Yeah, emphasizing yeah. his bass voice. 
Yeah, he. It, it was. Um, if there was anything pent up within Peter Tosh, it was much of the energy that 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 he that he had had in in years and and or, and decades prior. You know, with the with the whalers because because he did a whole lot more bass uh bass vocals back yeah, in, back in those days that. way yeah. yeah way more way more back in those days so 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 for, with this one right here it, it was it was the perfect one the perfect one for for peter to rock the bass vocals for 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 this one it, it, it was yeah. it was too perfect and and totally. definitely a proud moment i feel like there's discussion on what we should count yeah. Do we count the complete? Because we haven't taken into account any, my thoughts are, we haven't taken into account any bonus tracks on the remasters of 2002. This only came out full in 2002. The only thing that Peter got to see released was the original seven track. Seven tracks. Five. Yeah. And I feel it could greatly vary where it could be in some ways but not by too not by too much because i still have that weird stance on i feel like a lot of times the live albums with reggae can only get so high in the ranking for albums um but yeah that is true but because of how great this live album is yeah it's yeah <laughs> Mm -hmm. Honestly, if any if anyone who is watching this has not heard Captured Live, you're missing out on one of the greatest live albums ever made. And seen. You and gotta seen. see the footage. Yes, you have to see the footage too. It is mind-blowing. This album, I call it Peter Tosh on steroids. <laughs> This was at his peak, where he was at. Mm -hmm. He was in his prime. The band, it was like because I heard the performances from '82, right? But they were not as tight as this. This particular concert, this particular oh. concert, I don't know if there was just something in the air, but they were just so locked in. I'm sure it helped too that they knew this was going out and being filmed. I knew. I think it was like, oh yeah, we're bringing our A game for sure. There's only one member of the Tamlins who's still with him. His name is Winston Morgan. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's Winston Morgan, Vision, and Steve Golding that are doing the harmonies. Right. Mm. And they sound wow. incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's it's right up there with the Tamlins. It's not as as sharp as the Tamlins were, but no. it, it it it's it's really smooth and they, you know, go ahead. Yeah, what one thing I will say is it's interesting because I feel like in the earlier songs that is played, you can tell they're not as sharp easier. In like the Mama Africa, and you know that in that album, it feels like it's like because they were there while it's being done, so it's yeah. like they feel more used to it than like, um, you know, some of the earlier ones, like maybe like Africa. Well, I guess we're not counting African or wait, is African? Oh, African. Yeah. African and equal rights and down presser, man. They, they sound great for sure. Yeah. But um, it, it's definitely a different version to paint on the backing, but then also just how cool it is that vision is backing too, because vision came in when Bob was in Delaware. So vision is also very much, uh, you know, one of the original lineups of the Whalers. It's a completely unnecessary question. Captured live, Babylon by bus. How? What do you think? Captured live. Yeah, I say that without hesitation. I, I I feel like I I feel like I could agree with that as well. Okay, you see, <laughs> he's not very fond of captured live when I showed him it because it had to do with Johnny Be Good in particular. Because he said there's no horns and there's no female backing vocals. And I said, well, oh, he's wow. never toured right. with horns or female backing vocals. Definitely what's been officially put out, probably the best Peter concert 
and it's all in one performance. He didn't need to do the best ofs from several different performances. It's all there in one go. Oh, okay. There it is. There it is. It starts off with coming in hot. Amazing version. An amazing version. It the, Every song that they do has twice as, uh, twice as much energy than the record. Yeah. Yeah. Then it goes into Bush Doctor. Mm. This one takes the original and tears it to shreds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yet, like what you said earlier, Keith Richards, he, he was only doing like little riffs in between. You know, he was just yeah. filling in the gaps. But Donald does this whole solo and then they go into the break. You know, Jandellis, you have not heard this version of African. Oh my God. It. It's so great. <laughs> Santa on the bongos. Yeah. That, oh my gosh. I forgot about that part. I don't know how. The part at the end, just the extended doom, 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 and mm. seeing Peter jumping around and dancing and stuff and like doing his kind of his chugging dance. And well, then I also like to quickly say for coming in hot too, I've always loved the, um, is it the third verse? Um, yeah, the third verse of this, how it comes in from the solo, because the solo on the studio version isn't a solo. It's just a break. Yeah. It's just, you know, um, and Donald on the solo live is killing it and how Peter just kind of comes right back in afterwards in the energy with the I got up the other day. My heat just never, never went away. 103 on the hour. I had to head for the, for the shower. shower. <laughs> that, part, that part is my favorite verse live just because of how he just comes in with it right after the solo. It, oh, man. Mm -hmm. Get up, stand up. How, yeah, how how do you compare it to Bob's live version? Because there's the studio version with the Whalers. There's Bob's very distinctive live version, which is this similar to the Whalers, but it's still different than the Burning record. And then yeah, there's it's right. completely different. It's day and night. And I, it takes part yeah, no, of no, no, Peter's uh, and Bob's again. Clearly, day clearly day and night. So, so, it, so I'm going strictly yeah. on on. Uh, Equal rights studio version versus captured live, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then I love how he uses parts of Bunny's uh the bunny intro, the we want the truth. Want the we truth. Want yeah. But but also what I like, it's not as overpowering as in bunnies. In bunnies, it feels like it's taking a while to kind of build up. And with this one, it feels like they're like building it brick by brick with with uh vision in in uh Winston, right? Winston Morgan, yeah. Winston Morgan and uh, and Steve Golding, how they're building it up, but it's not because it's not the lead singer doing it. It's like kind of like you're hearing it chanting from the background, and then Peter just comes. I mean, just totally throwing punches into it. I mean, and then I, I, like I said, you if you see the video, yeah, and, and there's one scene too when they're doing get up stand up, where Donald Kinsey runs and jumps in the air. Yeah, right yeah, when they yeah. do the break, and then Santa hits the symbols and points at it. <laughs> <laughs> How it's Peter's already off stage. Yeah. You don't even see anymore. You just hear an echoing reverb voice. The credits are rolling and the footage as it's happening. It's just, yeah. he's not letting a manager censor him in this version because he's on stage he and, he it, has yeah. mic, and he's going hard with it too. Like, you know, he's just, he's just like, I mean, this is an angry, passionate you know, militant version, and it's it's it, it is the intense. That's the only way I can describe it. That version is intense, and it is the best version that Peter yeah. has ever done. And the fact that it's number four is crazy. It needs to be the ender, the ending. Yeah. yeah. On on this, it, yeah. And then we have Johnny Be Good. The uh, when the guitar solo goes in and the bass changes. So he's go he goes in for the second solo at the end. And then he starts playing the riff with Foley. And it's just driving, just driving and driving. It's I don't want it to end. And then it oh. ends. And even when it ends, it's like a it's like <laughs> yeah, and his additions with the vocals, the energy on the on the come on and go. I said go now, Johnny be good. I mean, 
the, yeah. how he's just throwing his whole voice into those those like you know go johnnies and and stuff like that is just awesome yeah he, that's the thing he sang it he sang it even tighter on this one yeah yeah all right and uh also real quick that the version the original release it is edited down a bit is it yeah um, the end is uh, the end is a little longer uh on the full yeah. version but they they do cut it they do cut it down there is absolutely unless you're a co collector of a collector in the completest there is no need to get the original captured yeah. live. Just go get yeah. the complete. Get the complete one. Get, Either on and the you could footage, but... you could find it on vinyl a lot easier now too. Mm -hmm. It's a super cool shot that's in the DVD. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, speaking of the DVD, one thing that's interesting that I'm realizing it has stuff that isn't on the CD. Which I always thought what was on here was, was what was on on here. I just figured like so they cut off um, Buckingham Palace at the beginning. You don't hear light up your spliff, light up your chalice. That they sense. completely cut that part out in the version. Um, you don't hear walk and don't look back. Um, I'd really like to see that live version. I I just like to see what he's doing. Yeah. During it, I, I would have actually liked to have seen that too. And you yeah. hear. You, you hear Keith Sterling. Keith Sterling does a uh, keyboard solo at the end, and he does bend down low. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. Bend down low. Yeah, yeah. And also, what's what I'd love to see too is the encore of Mama Africa. I'd love to see him come back yeah. on stage mm. and and perform because the thing is too, what's Kind of going into like the stage prince of Peter, he has this full on outfit every show. You know, it's not the same. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, it's more reserved or whatever, but it right. doesn't stay the same throughout the whole show. He'll slowly take off the sunglasses, he'll take off, you know, the um, head pieces. But then when he comes back out for the like um, encores and stuff, he could be in completely different stuff because he's already taken off all of the. So also he could come out looking completely different. I'd love, I mean, it's like a 10 minute live version of Mama Africa, right? Something mm -hmm. like that. It's around nine, yeah, nine minutes, 19 seconds. I would love to see, and plus I'd love to see Copeland do the, the introduction. Yeah. So I'll just skip past Equal Rights and Down Person Man. It, it is a good medley and stuff, but I want to get to Rastafari is. Bob's is war for sure. War and maybe like Exodus as like the most powerful live performances and like man like just it's worth the price of getting any version at all i mean it would have been worth the price of the ticket just to see that one just to hear it from outside of the theater it's uh, incredible it's the definitive version his live a tribe during it is extremely powerful He's commanding the whole audience. I mean, you can see in the shots where it does kind of show the audience a little, they're hypnotized. They're com I mean, he's right at that point, he's lit his spliff too. Yep. So that's when the that's when the, the spliff gets lit. And then uh, Keith. Out, yeah, the keys Keith are going. Hits the, yeah, the like sort of to make like a thunder noise and yeah. stuff. And oh, yeah, the yeah, I got to point this out. Uh -huh. All right. Apart from it being over 12 minutes long. Yeah. Donald Kinsey's solo that he does in it. But watching his face while he's doing it too. Yep. I mean, is, and then like, damn, is Peter's Kete playing oh. with Vision for the Nyabingi section? Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, dude <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i've seen i've like that's the that's i mean there's highlights throughout on every single song on here but that whole breakdown of rastafari is is yeah. the moment i i also love that when it's going back in and you hear the harmonies as yeah. the, as the, the, the drums boom, are going boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> 
and then the harmonies come in, and then it all comes back in. I feel like that shot of Don Kinsey with the smoke coming out of his hair. <laughs> <Yeah. thinking about laughs> <this. laughs> uh, but uh, but also on account of the the fullness, uh, the, the 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 fullness of it, uh, it, it is. It still does remain at uh, at at number eight, you know. It, but 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 again, no no no. The the best thing that that could have ever happened, really and truly, the best thing that could have ever happened to uh, capture live, or for all intents and purposes, a much better use of fonts for the cover. That that's the first and foremost thing. But other than that. Uh, the, the best thing that could have ever happened to Capture Live was the full concert being put, uh, put, put together. Finally, yeah. finally being released. Yeah. That was that was that was the absolute best thing that could have happened to it. No, I I do understand. Obviously, uh, you know the limitations of the standards of how, how live of just how albums in general, much less live albums, were back in 1984. That 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 in itself is one thing. However, for what it was worth, and again, going back to the, the going back to my experience, if they were going to narrow it down to to a number of tracks, they could have taken some of the other tracks and 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 used them there. So some of them may may have had to have been re re replaced with others. Maybe may, maybe have eight tracks. Number one, that that same uh, interview piece that, that you that you were talking about, the one yeah. uh, which he was prepared for from New York. For yeah. example, when I asked EMI why why is not the um the live album released, they told me they released forty thousand America in one day. It was so, it sold off. So? One day. Seen and no more was put out from that time. These things are the things that I bumbuckle I talk about. I had never seen this album until like the late two thousands. Yeah. Or so. The I never I never knew a live album actually existed. And so when you take that into consideration and when I and when I finally actually saw it for myself, I, I definitely could see where, where he was coming from. I, I would not be surprised that every that what he said was uh, absolutely not only true but uh, uh, justified what the the anger that he had yeah. for what was happening at the time for of the initial release you know I mean I mean obviously we're seeing it now as far as the repackaging because they keep because they keep what the original packaging looks like but does but for all intents and purposes does that would that stand out as far as a lot does that look like a the design a definitive design for a live album for Peter Tosh. Does that really? Thank you. Exactly. That yeah, does not look like Africa. any care was put <laughs> what was put in it. And all the more reason how I know how I really felt like like whoa, whoa, whoa Peter was not joking in in, in that in that uh, in that at that press conference. You know he wasn't joking when you when you take a look at the final result and you see it's as plain as hell. It, all the other albums that came before it, Mama Africa, the the one that came right before it. This is a live album, and this is what we get for the design. Mm -hmm. it, it, it it was the, the end result. What we got in it, it, on the original uh, release was not indicative of what what I knew could have been a much better arranged product. And obviously, it it, it was not indicative of what the both of you yeah. were able to see with the full release of Captured Live. And the fact that all of this and it's still you know sold out the day of and people are demanding a new release and because yeah. this is after all the success from johnny be good and the touring afterwards to promote the album this is the peak this is the height of demand for peter and the fact that it sells out all of this and peter is able to show the thing he's been telling people the whole time is they limit yeah. reggae and how many copies they even make when that is projected in the mind of the people, it will look because if you see it as a hit, many millions of people will see it as a hit. Mm -hmm. See? And when they see it as a hit, you know what is created in their mind. I have money. See? <laughs> and that is general that is one of the way, diplomatic way of assassination, spiritual and verbal assassination. So it's a general campaign to keep reggae at a level. You're not supposed to sell more than 150 or maybe 200,000. And then them brand new, it hit. 
and it don't go further than 67 on the chart. Yeah, it's it's insane. Right. And also, by the way, number six for me. <laughs> <laughs> because Sony owns the first two albums, the first two years. They saw yeah. how well it did. They probably immediately were like, all right, what's the live thing that we have? Live and Dangerous? All right, get it ready. Because mm-hmm. we're doing the right. next record store day. So then Live and Dangerous went went up. Both of them top five in record sales. That right. for that, that, that was that was Sony, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's that right. tell you? Yeah. That there's demand when yeah. put when put out and when advertised too. They could have advertised both of those releases ten times more too. They oh yeah. Right. It, it, right. No. No. Here, here's the, here's the thing to take in the greatest of consideration. Major industry is not gonna advertise big like the, for 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 legacy acts like 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 they once did. That that that, that in yeah. itself is not happening. So yeah. so we're, we're definitely we're definitely gonna get them the way they the p- promotion the way we have been getting it. Uh, you know they're gonna push the way they push, but it's but social but through social media and through the commu- communities we we see a record store re- record store day. That that in itself is like nowadays the biggest kind of promotion for anything like yeah, uh, of this magnitude yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> the final peter tosh album oh, 1987 one, 1987 yeah. oh you got the music on vinyl pressing what's interesting too with the music on vinyl is just like what chandel was saying about how they want to put the bonus tracks it's really interesting because this has the single version of no nuclear war at the very end because for some reason, No Nuclear War only had one bonus track. Yeah. And hmm. there's more that could have been put out. Mm-hmm. What about those demos yeah. that appeared on, what on about, Equal Rights? What about Mystery Babylon, which should have been on the oh, album? Oh, oh, yeah. I would like to point out, again, backing vocals. And on the first track, how bone chilling they sound when, when you pointed out that weird cut in buckingham palace there's a weird cut like it was accidentally muted in the mix with the backing yes how it just kind of cuts in with oh yeah. yeah i've noticed that too what else is interesting too about that press conference since he was or in the, i mean the the thing is people are like Peter lost a lot of valuable time in those three years stretch. That three year stretch. Yeah, sure. yeah. Sure, he was resting his vocals. He was getting more ready and rested. You know, well deserved with all the injuries he'd sustained over his career. Just getting some rest time. But this had been ready for some time before it went out. And again, it sat on EMI's shelf until they figured out some like. I guess financial problems they had with Peter or um, some legal issues and stuff. But I remember Peter saying that this was ready, I think, in like 1986. And rem- like he was doing all that press in 1986. Yeah. And then it didn't come out until 87. So we could have got maybe a whole other album if EMI was on their game. No doubt, because you could hear. You could hear P- how excited Peter was on these recordings. Yeah. Like he was, like you said, well rested. And it was like he was ready to just get back into it. Awesome artwork too. Also interesting. Yeah. I have the, I believe it's the South African uh, copy of the oh. 2002 remaster, which doesn't have the bonus track. Okay. Hmm. And okay. look at the CD. Yeah, that's that's way different. Yeah, that actually looks like a bootleg. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. It's, but it has the full booklet and everything. Right, right. It well, has the uh, yeah. One thing regarding the uh, the artwork, Neville said that the uh, tank top or the what they call the marina wasn't originally on there. Right, look more like an photo armor. of the original one, and I've and same with the gas mask. I don't think. I think yeah. it was Peter with his sunglasses. It was based on like that promo shot with the lock going down his face, and and f- and from afar, uh, I mean, I could be wrong because it's because it seemed like the the marina 
is um it looks more silver than white you know so so yeah so if you look at it from afar it looks more like armor i think know? it yeah. is yeah right isn't it meant to be armor yeah that is yeah. armor you can see the bolts of yeah. where the shoulders are yeah oh i oh, see there you go now go to jail uh i love how heavy that one sounds you know yeah yes um yeah, that's and definitely then, armor. yeah yeah and then you have fight apartheid which is the the remake of and like what you said oh, earlier this one sounds a lot brighter you know but i like how punchy the uh backing vocals are on it yeah so that that's what i like about it um and then there's vampire good version but not as spooky as the original i do love his voice though on it yeah i think the deadpan delivery more for the uh 76 77 version helps benefit just the the song in the meaning itself but i really love his voice on it all right then in my song in that my song. one is so damn mm. sweet and it's the little, amazing. that little guitar riff in between fantastic fantastic and then lessons in my life uh i like how dramatic this one sounds yeah again the backing vocals on this are so damn good i mean and then it ends on come together which is his final statement yeah but again it doesn't feel like it's over it felt like he still had a lot more in him this album's really grown on me um it's one of the last ones that i checked out um just because i was more familiar with um the earlier stuff and it's interesting for me and it might just because um you know i was still younger in the early 2000s going into the early 2010s but for me this one felt really undercover and and felt like i did it hear much about it and i feel like in i feel like it's also gotten more of a bad rap than majority of his others i feel like it's closer with bush doctor is how it's reviewed and it, again i was telling zeb before we started recording i internally felt bad and sad at putting one album at number eight because I felt they all deserve top five, but it's not possible mathematically. Not possible. Um, I put this at number eight, mostly because it was between that and Bush Doctor for me. And I felt like there's just too many things on Bush Doctor, like um, mm. Stan Firm and Moses in these really cool experimental tracks that just... And I also felt like Bush Doctor is just more iconic in some ways or more known. That was his first before Mama after his first really big push into the U.S. market. And um, but I, I still really love No Nuclear War. And I think um, it's interesting. Both Mama Africa and No Nuclear War, his last two studio albums, have an eight minute, you know, around eight minute title track at the very beginning. So it's a really interesting pattern. Um, I really like it. I don't like the single version, though, which is interesting. You would think shorten it down, it would get, you know, the kind of short but sweet, right to the point. But they make the wrong edit choices on the single version. They choose to just keep doing the chorus rather than getting straight to the verses, which could have been the best way to get the main message across. Instead, uh -huh, yeah. they do you know, five times the chorus and then two verses. But really, the the verses in here are powerful. I mean, he's going over the straight statistics of people dying and the malnourished babies and people who were pleading for death because they don't want to live anymore in these conditions. Yeah. And you want to know the you want to know the double edged sword about about that right there. The, you know the the, ma the major industry clearly does not want, um, you know, really 
the most crucial or critical of messages coming out from crucial and or cri and critical messengers uh, of of such, especially coming out of a, a genre like reggae. But at the same time, on the uh, and then of course the whole thing about nu nuclear nuclear warfare that 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 that's scary enough as it is. So it's so so you'd figure. Um, on on one hand, they, they 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 don't want to they don't want to frighten anyone when because because bear in mind because because you were talking about the single when it comes down to singles the first and foremost I, uh, objective of a single is to hit the radio right okay? so that so that's the key thing so so there's that on the other hand at the same time it was 1987 and there was a hell of a lot of social commentary going on at that time then. So that's the part where it really doesn't make any sense. And moving on to not go to jail again, it, it's, it's showing that it doesn't matter that, you know, if it's 76 or 86, 87, that Peter can write a good, you know, legalize and decriminalize cannabis song. It's a happy Peter song too which is weird yeah. he's talking about his inspector that's his friend and his you know and the minister that's his friend and they're all giving him weed <laughs> and, and i mean it's like it's showing really what after going through the struggles of legalize it and bush doctor what you could get to of it being you know normalized and you know respected um fight apartheid i really love his voice on it um, go, go, uh, goes on a higher octave with this one. We, we know yeah, right there. yeah, and um, I really like Vampire as well. Not as much as the original version. Same with Fight Apartheid, um, right. but I still like them both. In my song is my favorite track off of here. <laughs> what I really like too, talking about octaves, higher octaves at the very end for the first time, really in a Peter song, how they 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 transition up at the end. I mean, you just feel like you've reached a peak, like you're climbing this mountain or something. And also you get to the top of it and it's so cool. And um, oh. yeah, the guitar lick on it is, is great. I mean, you just, you feel this, this and lesson in my life feel like the two definitive, or this is defining Peter's final messages lesson in my life in my song and come together i feel like all on the second side mm -hmm. it feels like these are like his goodbyes in some ways even though obviously they weren't meant to be at that point right and i feel like getting to that the reason it's at the bottom i just don't like the post-production on it i don't really like the mixing in the uh i feel like it's over overdone it's over polished and kind of over produced in some ways i yeah, that's, feel that's understood i see um, yeah i definitely see what you mean with the mix I, I i don't find it the worst but i definitely know what you mean like like yeah. they could have like, like they could have pulled back on some of the 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 uh there's too much synths electronic drums and vocals yeah. and vocal effects at times because it feels like peter's voice isn't clear in some of these tracks Right. I feel like they're not as, like it is like it isn't at the front like it should be. Yeah. yeah. I feel like at times it sounds muddy, the mix mm. on some of these. It feels like there's too much being thrown in and it's all being put through one channel in some ways. And yeah. um I feel like um like let's let's see. Um I would also like listening. Mystery Babylon, I don't know if it's because it didn't get to the post-production phase because it wasn't included on the album, right. but I like that mix a lot more coming from the same sessions as No Nuclear War. I feel it sounds yeah. clear. There's, it's just clear, clean guitar by Donald. Yeah. Peter's voice is up front with a little bit of reverb. Right. And, um, same with the backing vocals. It all feels clear. There's the same, you know, kind of... To, but it's not on electric drums it doesn't sound like it just sounds like it's santa on the normal drum set and i feel like while i like the effect at times 
it just sounds too artificial or too electronic with the synths. The synths are already, you know, strong in the late 80s. Yeah. It, um, you know, it's just a sign of the times really with this, I feel like. Um, but there's too many, there's too much synths on here for me and there's too much electric drums. And I feel like if there is, a, I feel like, if there was one album that I'd really be interested in hearing, like the rough mixes or the stripped down mixes of it, I feel like if I could hear it more in a uh, less produced way, um, I feel like I it could easily go up in the top six or five or so because the material's there. And I think it shows because of how much I like Mystery Babylon in its mix and if no nuclear war who knows for an anniversary at some point if no nuclear wars deluxe was just a remix as the bonus tracks plus throw in John ja man and the jam dung and mystery babylon which both totally should have been on this i mean at this point peter's proven himself and it's eight tracks too i get it that no nuclear wars eight minutes but like Definitely Mystery Babylon. And I like John Man and the Jam Dunk too. And it just, I feel bad for that song because it kept trying and it kept <laughs> getting rejected. <laughs> yeah. For lack of better phrasing, you know, what what a, what a way to 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 go out, so to speak, you know? Um, yeah, not, 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 not go to jail. An, an, an amazing standout. It, it, it's, it's just the catchiness alone of it will, is, is memorable beyond uh the if, if there were if there was any such thing as checking Peter Tosh for a catchy tune, not go to jail is definitely by far mm -hmm. one of them. The, the, one of them to look forward to. Uh Fight Apartheid is is a great is is a great um a great remake and and, and uh, excellent remake uh the uh let me see in my song definitely the best one out of the bunch yeah definitely the definitely the best one out of the bunch uh it uh we we got lessons in my life we did we did not get the original version um as of yet back on uh bush doctor but uh but it was good that we that we that we did get this you know so especially so he, so, for his last one too yeah yeah, and he he was he was prepared, he was definitely preparing us uh, with that one in particular, and uh, uh, I think I think that testify also stands up for me. That that this one this one is number seven, and uh, I was almost uh, I was almost kind of going back and forth. This one I was uh, borderlining. I, I was thinking of. Sw switching that one for for, uh, for 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 Mystic Man, it's again, it was it was that tough mm -hmm. b b between between uh, 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 six and seven in the, in that regard. It, the, the no nuclear war, which I which I never got to hear for the longest time, but when I did, you know, uh, major major shout to uh, my brother Zeb. Uh, it it was uh, very very much. It, now, now you see why everyone was talking about it. You know, it, it, it what, what, not even the fact that it was his that it was his last album. Every this literally is one of his most popular and most talked about albums in general. God, God only you, you mentioned Peter Tosh. One of the first things that come out of people's mouth is either legalize it, equal rights, or no nuclear war. Or, or um, Bush Doctor definitely comes in there. But but as but, but as far as like like top most discussed for for a particular point in the in the uh late in early to late uh 2000s in particular the, the the general consensus was was uh no nuclear war was definitely among the top to be mentioned and so and and good reason why you know yeah. and definitely good reason why he he left he left us with uh with eight with eight great gifts and uh, the the la the last of which uh, he he was gonna make his mark, uh, come, for lack of better phrasing, come hella high water, and uh, he brought down the thunder, and uh, 
it, no nuclear war. He, he, he came with the thunder and uh, give us all something to to remember him by by any and all means necessary. That was that was Peter Tosh. <laughs>